and started it before I was even a commissioner. This is the third annual Community Resilience Symposium. And it is a collaboration of some people who are in this room and dozens of people who are not in this room. The Human Services Cabinet of Davis County, Utah, as well as the Human Services Directors here in Davis County, Utah. These people do this work of resilience professionally. And the idea was to create a symposium that could go out to the entire community of Davis County and to benefit uh, at a professional training down to the individual in any home anywhere through this county. So the first year <clears throat> we had 200 and that was in 2019. The second year, uh, and we maxed out our space, we moved to a bigger space last year and had over 300. And then uh, this year, because of the pandemic, we have had to go virtual with the conference and it turned out to be a good thing. We have now over 700 people who are registered and watching this, not only here in Davis County, but throughout the state of Utah. In fact, <laughs> um, last year I put the symposium flyer in the Christmas stockings of my family members. <laughs> this year, or at the end of last year for Christmas, um, the flyer went out to all of my friends and family in my Christmas cards, and that was over 600. And uh, so who knows what we'll do next year, but the having it virtual has presented an opportunity that it can reach a very broad audience. So we're very excited about that. Our goal in the years to come with this tradition is to have it permeate um, every individual, every workplace, every family, every organization. Now, <clears throat> we have, because this is our first time to do it virtually, um, a huge thanks to our information services, uh, Deputy Director Mike Pace. Thank you, Mike. This was a really big deal for us to do something like this in the county. <clears throat> Uh, following the symposium, there will be an evaluation link mailed to everyone. Please complete, uh, complete the evaluation form. In fact, we have had all of our attendees, almost all attendees do the evaluations every year and it drives the symposium. And we have been very pleased that uh, people who do this work professionally have said that this little symposium that cost $30 last year in person and included lunch, <laughs> was as good or better than, than professional conventions they have attended in other places in the United States. So we're very pleased for the, with the feedback and we would like your feedback, please. Um, you will receive the evaluation form after uh, the conference today is over. If you complete the form by February 12th, which is two weeks from now, then you will have the opportunity to be entered into a drawing to win uh, one of four $25 Amazon gift cards. So <clears throat> the ultimate goal of this symposium and all of the people who have worked hard to put it on is for Davis County to become a trauma-informed community that prevents adverse childhood experiences, builds resilience in individuals, families, and communities, provides a safe, supported, and connected environment, and provides access to treatment for those who have experienced trauma. We have three fantastic, renowned speakers who will share tools for us today on how we as individuals and organizations become connected and even more resilient. And I hope that with each of the three professional speakers that we have brought to you today, that there will be something from each one that really strikes you and stands out to you. And that, and that you'll write it down and remember it and, and teach it to someone else. And then I hope that you'll share this next year, join in next year and share it with other people that you know. And we look forward to this growing and doubling every year. Dr. Schramm. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. Dr. David Schramm is known as Dr. Dave 
on the campus of Utah State University and across the country. He is currently an associate professor of and family life extension specialist in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. Uh, he has a bunch of education. He's been around the nation. He has um, been on television monthly on Fox 13's The Place. He, uh, his drive is to help individuals, parents, and couples thrive in their life journeys. From British Columbia to Beijing, China, from St. Louis to San Diego, Dr. Dave has given over 500 presentations, classes, and workshops to a variety of audiences, including the United Nations and a TEDx talk in Florida. He married his high school sweetheart, Jamie, and they have four children. Uh, he also loves peanut M&Ms, and he lives in, with his family currently in North Logan, Utah. We'll turn it over to Dr. Dave. Hey, thanks so much. Um, man, Davis County team, I appreciate it. This is wonderful. I love what you're doing. And just in case, yeah, here, here's my peanut m and I'm running low. So I go through one of those a week about. No, hey, I'm, I'm so excited to, to talk about this topic. I think it's such a, an important topic that can be, uh, is relatable to, to everyone. I know it's a bummer that we have to do this um, virtually, but uh, if you're like me, right, it's tie up top and then my, my joggers on the bottom. All right, let's be real. Um, but I'm going to share some things I think that will be helpful for you um, personally and professionally in your family and your relationships. And so I'm going to share my screen and we will uh, we'll jump right in. Now, fair word of, of warning. I'm going to go fairly fast <laughs> through this. And so I, I share the slides. If you want the slides, they're, they're available. Uh, you can get them at the drdaveshram.com. Uh, but let's jump right in because it's been a, man, it's been a crazy year right? Nice cup of 2020. And then, yeah, the, it feels like that that's what we've had. We've taken this right, right to the face. Here's Matthew McConaughey. Um, yeah, January 1st. And then by what, June 9th, it was just, it was awful. Just this horrible, awful experience that we've had um, collectively, individually. Um, but it's important, I think, to, to look also at the more, the more humorous side. There has been some, some funny things that have happened. Here's, here's a, I love this one. When this was first started and, and masks weren't really out and people were uh, panicking, we just didn't know what to do. I love this, the scotch, right? The scotch pad right there. She's probably, <laughs> there's probably more fumes in that one that, um, than the, the coronavirus there for that one. Um, but here's Elf on the Shelf. I don't know if you received your Elf on the Shelf this year. This is what we, we received in the mail. And then uh, American Girl Doll, if you're an American Girl Doll fan, this is what homeschool Heather, this is what it looked like this, this year. Uh, but now school shut down um, and it was just a, a, just a really weird time for a lot of people and time of isolation and we'll get to all of that. But really, I have to be honest, when school finally was back in session, we had four kiddos, four teenagers. And I did, I was like, oh yeah, I love my kids. I promise I love my kids. But when they went back, it was just this feeling of, uh, yes, you know, some type of, of normalcy for them and, and for, for me as well. But on the, on the more serious side, so I've tracked, uh, I've really paid attention to the happiness. I'm interested in what this has done with Americans in our families, in our individual lives. And honestly, it's taken quite the hit. Uh, the happiness has tanked. It's never been so low that we've dipped this historic low of 50 years that we've been in this, this unhappiness. Now, I don't know how uh, accurate Twitter is, but they have this hedonometer that tracks um, how happy Twitter is over time and really kind of this pulse in the, in the nation and the world. And you can see with the, the protests and the, the brutality and the things that are happening of, of what has happened in our nation just this past year. Now, yes, or just last night, I actually, I added this new one. And if you take a, a close look at all the things, it has the, the storming of the U.S. Capitol right there, and it shows that it's taken this, this dip. But as you look at 2020, even from Twitter, again, how reliable is that? But it shows yeah, exactly what's, what's happening in the, in the country. And it is. So we have had a, a bitter year, honestly. And so how do we become better after experiencing the bitter? And I hope to be able to share some things that will be helpful for, for you in your lives. First off, let's start with, I think fundamentally, we have to get, understand this, that we are all born with three fundamental human needs. Okay, ultimately we're born with the need for safety. It's this, this drive to survive. So it's food, clothing, and shelter, emotional safety as well. And when that need is met, 
then the result is I feel at peace. The second need that we all have is the need for satisfaction. The need for the bowl of ice cream or our right our diet, Dr. Pepper, that's my drink of choice. It's to be able to do fun, enjoyable things, to go out, to enjoy life, but it's also professional development. It's, it's yearning for learning. It's this desire to acquire things and have recognition and, and do fun, enjoyable things. And when we have that need met, we feel contentment. Now, the third need that we all have is connection. We're all born with this longing for belonging, really, this craving for connection with, with other people. And those are formed from all kinds of things. Here's a few with gratitude and kindness and empathy. And when that need is met, we feel love. Okay, now I want to point out real quick that the pandemic, as much as, as it done, has done for, right for, for the nation, our country, for the world, what it ultimately has done it has crushed these three needs. Now, it's one of the few things historically that has wiped out all three needs at one time. For safety, that's an obvious one. Physical safety, emotional safety, satisfaction. Can't go out and for that period of time. We couldn't go out to restaurants. We couldn't do things um, that were fun, enjoyable. Our kids were cooped up and it was driving them nuts. We had to come up with these you know, home movies and videos and, and they all went viral on Facebook and Instagram. And we couldn't see our loved ones. And many of us still can't see our, our parents, our loved ones, those in care centers were separated. And so that, that need for connection uh, has been crushed. And so big picture, we, we have to remember these three fundamental human needs, not only for you, but for your, your children as well. And we'll come back to these throughout. So safety, satisfaction, and connection are, are key, fundamental for, for flourishing. Okay, so how does stress affect us? I think we all, we all get this. I won't spend too much time on this, but ultimately it affects how we think, what we feel and and what we do so we'll have this experience a situation will occur whether it's a a miscarriage or a divorce or we get in a car accident or something happens and then we have a thought a thought like oh no what's going to happen and then it turns into emotion which is uh, fear or anger and worry anxiety and then behavior and sometimes it's it's non-behavior sometimes it's just we shut down and we can't function we don't do anything and other times it's we, we um, act irrationally and we go out and we buy, we hoard toilet paper and those kinds of things. And so you see what the pandemic has done. It's a, a thought an experience and then this thought and then it creates this emotion and then behavior. And, and ultimately what overwhelming stress does, now some stress is good and it motivates us. A little bit of stress can kind of get us a kick in the pants and get us going. But stress ultimately turns us inward and then makes us look downward. And that's the opposite of happiness. Happiness is we search inward and then we turn outward when we're happy. But stress and anxiety and depression, they all do the exact opposite. We, we turn inward. So stress, we know it from the right doctor visits and it's linked to the six leading causes of death, all those horrible things. And that's true. But I hope by the end of, of this hour that we'll, we'll have a better understanding of what we can do to, to help uh, with some of that. So again, big picture, we experience, here's, you know, we're going along in life, we experience a crisis, there's a period of, of disorganization. Think about it in your own life, something that has happened and then disorganization um, occurs after that. Let's say a separation, a divorce, again, or your teenager gets pregnant, something happens and disorganization from kind of the normal um, way things are going. And then there's a period of reorganization. Sometimes things will never be the same again, a death or a divorce or disease, something has happened and the kind of the new normal is, is down uh, lower than the normal. Sometimes we rise back up and sometimes we're actually resilient and come up above that. So what are some of those factors? And that's what I'm gonna talk about. What separates those who do really well and those who kind of tank off all right, understanding big picture, I'm gonna get a little um, professory on you, but this is not a complicated model, right? We have a stressor event, which leads to stress and crisis, but it depends. And it depends on two major things. One is the resources, which I'll talk about, but I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about perception and things that, that influence our perception, things that you have control over. And so that's, that's the big picture, that's where we're going. So let's start with resources. So what resources do you have? Where, where, where do you turn? 
is it, and sometimes, right, people will turn to social media or they'll turn to friends or loved ones or a faith group or a, a pet, right? We have our Yorkie here and he's become really attached. He's, so if he starts barking, you'll know that he, he's right here. He's one of the, yeah, he, he brings us joy and comfort during um, tough times, but it can be all kinds of things. And so turning to others, I want to highlight and, and spend just a minute on, on relationships because that is one of the, the strongest predictors of, of how well um, that we do. So all kinds of things that we can rely on uh, as far as resources, helping us through a tough time. One of these being a conference, right? We come together, we learn new things. That's one of the three needs, right? Satisfaction, desire to learn um, new things. So there was a study done at, at BYU, uh, meta-analysis, so it looks at all these factors that predict um, how long and how well, well we'll live in this life. So you start right there, clean air, not a strong, cash valley sometimes it seems like in these inversions that the, the clean air is a predictor, but overall not a, not a strong predictor. Hypertension treatment, being lean versus overweight, not as strong as you would think. Uh, exercise, and other studies have actually shown that exercise deserves to be further um, down on the left. It's a stronger predictor. Um, more recent studies have shown that. Cardiac rehab, the flu vaccine, interesting, right? I won't get into the whole vaccine thing, but the science shows that the flu vaccine is a strong predictor of staying alive. Quitting drinking, quitting smoking. Okay, the final two. What are some of the strongest predictors of staying alive? We just talked about it close relationships. So what's number one? Number one, the strongest predictor of us staying alive is, you'll never guess, quitting Fortnite is actually the strongest predictor. Okay, no, it's not. It's not. So those who are not Fortnite, just ask your, ask your teenagers. So, or take a picture of this and then show your teenagers and be like, hey, you know, Dr. Dave, show that you're not going to stay alive if you keep, you keep playing this video game. It's actually social integration social integration and close relationships. But those trump everything, right? Genetics and, and smoking and all these other factors that science has shown. Close relationships, that's who you're quarantined with. Social integration is the, the other, you know, eight hours a day that many of us spend either at work with our colleagues or our religious or faith community, um, people at the grocery store, those people that we interact with, that's social integration and close relationships. So those are some of the, the most important resources that we can turn to. But what's happened during the pandemic? Again, this shouldn't be a surprise. This is connection. But we've been isolated, socially um, isolated and distanced from, from other people, which has taken its, its toll. Uh, if you're into TED Talks, I'm a, a big TED Talk fan. Look this one up. It's one of Dave's faves, one of my favorite ones. And it's a study on, on happiness, but they followed it. Now it's over 80 years long. They followed people. Now they're into the third generation, like their grandkids. And they've studied what predicts, again, how long and, and how well people live. And it's this. He says this, Robert says, the clearest message that we get from the 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. People who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. So checking in, even virtually checking, it's not the same, but for now, checking in phone calls and FaceTimes and Zooms, it's, it's critically important for people, especially during traumatic events, to have someone there to, to talk with. Okay, so um, we won't talk too much about this, but for those who are not familiar with, with ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, so it was back like 1998, this uh, amazing study that showed, and you see the 10 areas there, that just real 10 questions, 10 areas from divorce or substance abuse, or you had a parent in prison, for each one, they, they check a little box. And what they found is that the more boxes of those 10 that you check, the higher likelihood you are to experience all kinds of um, disruptions in neurodevelopment and in, in relationships and ultimately um, shorter lifespans. And so that's what that ACEs study has, has shown. But I like to look at the positive side. If you know me, I love to look, okay, what's the opposite? What's, what's, you can't do much about what happened in the past but you can do something about the present. And so I love this other study, this health outcomes of positive experiences or hope. And, and that study has shown really, why do some kids do this? Why do they do well and are resilient? And why do some tank? And that's what this study shows. And it shows ultimately what we're talking about resources. It, it talks about 
wonderful positive experiences that children have. So they can just have crummy childhoods, many of them, but having a mentor or a coach or a religious leader or a parent or step parent or grandparents, someone that, that comes in and fills that to give them hope and to help them through those, those tough times. And so again, resources in, in that little diagram when stressor events, having resources and relationships are some of our most um, impactful resources that we that we have but i'm going to jump to perception and i want to spend the rest of the time there because that's something that we have um, more control over is how we perceive things and so we'll, we'll talk about perception and we'll talk about really these these areas that i have on the screen we'll talk first a little bit about stress get into some brain and neuroscience stuff don't worry i'll, I'll keep it light um and and hopefully interesting to you and then we'll talk about distraction and how easily our brains get distracted, especially on Zooms, right? It's, it's tough. I know, I know. So hang in there. And then we'll talk about some positivity stuff, some things that you can actually do starting today to improve the positivity and actually create an upward spiral in your brain. Okay, so question for you. Think about this um, on a scale of one to 10. So this was a study, let me back up. So this was a study at Stanford and it was 30,000 adults and they were followed for eight years. So 30,000 adults followed for eight years and they were asked these questions and lots of other questions. But these are the two that, um, that I wanna focus on. The first question, how much stress did you experience the last year? Okay, now just think about it, 2020, on a scale of one to 10, what would you say? You can put it in the, in the chat if, you, if you'd like as well. Just what would you say? One to 10. And then that second question, do you believe stress is harmful for your health? And it's, 10 would be uh, yes, you know, strongly agree that stress is harmful to your health. Okay. So yeah, a lot of people saying, yeah, high stress and they, they had a really rough year. And yes, I believe that stress is harmful to my health. Okay. This is, this is what they found with this. They found that those who answered, a t you know, like at 8, 9, 10, that they, they had a really uh, tough year with a lot of stress in the past year, experienced a 43% increased risk of dying the following year. So these 30,000 adults and every year they're measuring, if they said yes, they experienced a lot of stress, 43% increased risk of dying, but only, only if they also answered strongly agree to that second question, do you believe that stress is harmful to your health? Isn't that interesting? So it was the combination of stress, but also believing that stress is harmful to your health. And so that, what does that mean? That kills about 20,000 people every year, not, not stress, but believing that stress is harmful to your body. That's what's killing people. Um, and it kills pe more people than, than skin cancer and HIV and even homicide every year, not stress that be leaving that stress is harmful to your body. And so what, you're like, wait, what? Guess who had the lowest risk of death in this study? Those who had high stress, but didn't believe that it was harmful to their health. You're like, wait, what? It's, it's true. So listen, listen to the TED Talk by uh, Kelly McGonigal uh, at Stanford. It's amazing. And it changes, hopefully, our perception of stress, that when we feel stress, instead of being like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening, take a breath, take a time out. And think, oh my goodness, this is my body preparing me. My heart rate and my respirations, this is my body preparing me for this experience or for this event. And so I want to come back, again, back to the diagram. Because look, when you change your mind or your perception about stress, or when you choose to view stress differently, it actually triggers the body. Your body responds differently when you view something differently. So when you don't view stress as oh my goodness, I can't do this and it's you know, we're all going to die. No, view it as, oh, a challenge instead, instead of a, a threat and re choose to connect with those around you. So your resources and your perception. Yeah, interesting study. Go watch, go watch the TED Talks. So you got a lot of TED Talks here to watch. Okay, so when I get stressed or lots going on, is it okay, Dr. Dave, to share this, to call up my mom or to call up my sister, call up my friends and, and complain? complain about all the stress and the tough times? Well, of course, the academic answer is always, it depends. It depends. So complaining just to complain, just to get it off my chest or, you know, just to vent to somebody, it, it may not be helpful. And this is why. It can often, because as soon as you start talking about the stress, 
it, your mind starts feeling like, okay, yep, I'm stressed because I'm talking about it and now there's a lot of stress going on. And so you you bring up the very emotions and counseling, right? I went through it. I, well, let's start back. Tell me what happened back in your childhood and, and maybe I was molested or some horrific things. Then I go to the next counselor. Tell me about your childhood. And the more and more that we bring that stuff up, it can trigger more and more anxiety and stress unless, unless, unless you also think about the, the why the event happened, what you have learned and what you can do now about it. So yeah, you can start with a complaint, but the goal is to move beyond that, to process it in healthy ways. And what, what have I learned from that? Instead of just venting to vent is not always the best thing because again, it creates more stress the more that you talk about stress and process it. So we have to rethink and we have to reframe stress. The lesson is, is stop dwelling on it and sharing it because it leads to more stress and anxiety and depression. And as we'll soon learn, when we're so consumed with stress, we can't be thinking about other things that are going on. So viewing it as a challenge instead of a threat and taking it and say, okay, what's the meaning behind this stress? Because all stress has meaning or it wouldn't be stressful. And so what is it? Process it. Take a some deep breaths and think, okay, I can handle, this is my body. I can feel my heart starting to race, preparing me for, for this challenge. So our brains, our brains have two modes. Okay. We have the focused and the interested, which I'm sure all 467 of you right now are just focused and interested, right? No, you're not. Okay. It's the focus and the interested. And we have the default, which is the uninterested. And, and what happens is, Throughout the day, we're constantly going back and, and forth with all of these. Now, when the world is really interesting, like right, like this, this Zoom, then we're we're all in and we're using all of this capacity and our attention is all there, but it takes effort. And we couldn't actually pay attention all day because we would be we would be drained. Some uh, you know, medical field or others where they're right there and they're doing surgeries, yeah, they, they're drained because they have to pay attention so much and we have limited. But the default. The uninterested, when the world is boring, then the brain really sulks. It just goes to this default mode. And, and a wandering mind, right? It doesn't cost you anything, but it's very expensive because what it often does, a wandering mind tends to wander where? It tends to wander to the stress and what I have coming up. And when you can't sleep at night, it's because there's worry and there's concern and there's stress, right? So that's what happens um, with the in default, we tend to go negative. And again, all day long, we're switching back and forth be, between these. Okay, so, and research shows, again, most of our thoughts in the default are neutral or negative. And so that's why, that's why your brain doesn't have much fun when you leave it alone with itself. So is mind wandering positive or, or negative? Well, there was a study done by um, Matt Killingsworth and Dan Gilbert. And what they did is they had an app and then they had over 15,000 um, readings of this. And they would send people a question, just a little interruption and say, hey, what are you doing right now? Right? It would just come on their phone that say, okay, what are you doing? And are you paying attention to what you're doing? And how are you feeling? So they wanted to find out, you know, how often are people mind wandering? And it turns out the mind wandering rate on average, about 47% of the time when we're engaged in a task, we're not focusing on what we're doing. Isn't that wild? And it ranges from self-care, right? Taking a shower. How many of you ladies, right? Getting ready this morning, you're putting on your makeup. Well, some of you probably don't have your makeup because you're in your jammies still. And you're like, okay, yeah, this looks really good. Self-care almost... Yeah, we're hardly ever are really paying attention, focused. We're usually in the default in the mind wandering. And it goes from uh, commuting, you're driving, you ever get on to work, you're, you've come home and you're like, man, how did I get here? The car just goes there. It happens a lot. Or working, I'm working, I'm working. you're not working. About half the time, 47% of the time, you're thinking about something other than what you're actually doing at work. Look at it with, with taking care of your kids. How many of you are guilty of this? Child comes up and says, hey, mom, mom, look at this, or dad, look at this. And you look over and you say, oh man, that's great, honey. You have no idea what they just said, right? Because our minds tend to wander. We, we go on this autopilot mode a lot, eating, exercising, talking, making love. Yeah, don't ask your partner about that one. What about Zoom calls? So I totally made this one up. But I, about 98% of the time, I'm thinking, right, most of you, your mind has wandered because you, it's either not interesting or something else is, is happening. This, so this is a great case study of how well we're able to, to pay attention. So why does all this matter? 
well, first we need the default mode because the, the default activity, it's good, right? You get in the shower and you have these thoughts or sometimes, you know, some of your best thoughts um, happen when you're in the default mode. But the, the danger happens when we, ex uh, we, there's too much time, too much time and we constantly dwell on stress and imperfections and all the crummy things that are going on in the world or we're watching the news constantly and th which is kind of default right mode and our mind kind of wanders in and out okay now which leads to this and in my mind this is one of the most uh, important slides that we're talking about Okay, all of us experience emotions even right now even if you're in the default mode you're in the uninterested mode right now all of us experience emotions in the present, but many of our emotions are anchored in the past or in the future. For, for example, look at this one, the past, grief. And now these are important emotions. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't experience these. I'm just saying, don't set up camp in these emotions. Anger, anger is always about something we can feel it now, but it's about something that has happened in the past. We're so upset about something that someone said to my child or someone cut me off and it's in the past, but we keep stewing about it. Same with guilt and shame is always in the past. Okay. What about, what about the future? Oh, you know this. It's all about things that haven't happened yet. It's worry and it's anxiety, it's stress, it's helplessness, it's tension. Do you see what happens? That we set up camp often in the future or in the past. And what do we miss out on? We're missing out on the present, on the good stuff that happens right here and now, on the happiness and joy and interest and surprise and calmness and all these wonderful emotions that tend to happen in the present, that we experience them in the present. Instead, we're so caught up in the past and, and, or worried um, and stressed about the, the future. So our brain, it's wired really to focus on, on three things, really to wire when we're, you know, we're interested in there. It's really interested in three things. One is pleasure. Anything that, that brings pleasure, that is, yes, that brings joy and happiness right now. Yes, I, I want to do this. Let's go. And let's go out to eat or a big hunk of cheesecake. Pleasure. Another one that it focuses on is novelty, something that's new and interesting. That's why, right? That's why if you're scrolling through Instagram and you get to, or you've seen that post before, you hurry and scroll through it because it's not new. The brain craves new and novelty, something that's really interesting to it. And then, yeah, it tries to figure it, figure it out. And then the last thing it is focused on is threat, threats. Now, when these three compete, pleasure, novelty and threat. Which, which one's going to win? It's going to be threat. It's going to be threat almost every time threat. And do you remember this really relates back to what the three needs of safety, satisfaction, and connection. And this one's safety. Fundamentally, uh, we'll do everything in our, in our we can to, to be safe. And so threat and so how does this relate to what we're talking about with trauma and stress and all that's going on? Our, our default in many instances, if we've got a lot of trauma, a lot of stress, a lot of worry in our life, we're going here. That what does that mean? It means we're not paying attention to all the other good stuff that's happening. In fact, we're born with five times as many neurons that are wired for negativity and threat for every one that is wired for positivity and opportunity. Again, five times as many that are wired for threat and negativity for every one that's wired for, for all positivity. In fact, we're wired, we're five times as likely to notice, see the negative and notice the takes. Now, did you see it? Did you, did you see? I misspelled it on purpose because our brains are wired to notice the negative. I'll prove it. Your child comes home with a report card. They've got five A's and a C minus. <clears throat> Where's your brain go? <laughs> right to the C minus immediately, immediately right? Or your husband walks out in his shirt, sun's or whatever, or he's got, so we look for flaws and imperfections. You green grass? Well, we don't have grass in Utah right now because it's especially here in Logan. We won't see it till May, but we see brown spot instead of all the green Christmas lights. I drove by right during that Christmas season and, and our, we had one light bulb burned out. So where does my attention go? It goes to the one dang bulb that's burned out. 
So we're drawn to the negative. We're drawn to people's imperfections. We nitpick them. In our children, in our spouses and partners, we're wired for negativity five times as much. And so we're drawn really to imperfections more than to positive qualities. We have to first be aware of that. And then we have to work five times as hard to notice the good uh, in others. So we get easily distracted with, with stress because our brains right now, our brains are presented with about 11 million pieces of information. A lot of the stuff, maybe some of you can hear my voice, but maybe you're scrolling Instagram, you're talking with somebody else and all this stuff is happening. Or maybe some of you need to use the bathroom or you're hungry or whatever it is. So internal signals and external stuff that's coming at us, 11 million pieces of information. And we can only focus on about 40 bits, 40 little, we call it attention, but my attention's here and then it's here. Because right now I guarantee no one right now is thinking about their left pinky toe, okay? Well, now you are because I told you that, but you weren't before because we can only focus on a little things here and then there, right? ADHD, our attention's all over our 40 bits. We're all over the place, okay? So that means we get to choose. When I first saw this, I was like, Dave, this is nuts. I get to choose my 40 bits. I get to choose what to, to focus on and dismiss or ignore. But again, we're wired for threats. Right? We're wired if someone came, you know, if I made a loud noise and we all jumped because we're wired to pay attention to, to threats. And so ultimately our reality is a choice. Part of that perception, remember the stress and our perception and the resources, how we perceive the stress. We, we get to choose that. And so how, what we choose to focus on, it really shapes um, how you perceive stress. So here's the trade-off. I can think about the negatives and all the news and all the crazy stuff, just negativity, negativity, negativity all the time. That, that means my 40 bits are already consumed there. And that means that I can't see the positive or I can shift my mindset and choose to see the good around me. Now, that doesn't mean that, oh, yeah, just ignore all the bad, just only focus on the good. That's not my message. You can process the yucky and the negative with other people or counselors or work through it, but don't, don't get stuck in the past or in the future learning to enjoy the present because when you have stressful stuff going on, we're, our default is to get distracted and to focus on that. Okay, so some of you probably uh, have seen this study. So this study was back um, done about 20 years ago. And what they did is the invisible gorilla study. So what they did is they had people watch. They said, okay, count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball, right? So they have these, just, this is actually a picture from the actual video and they've got some dressed in black and some dressed in white and they're passing a basketball and they have to count how many times in the black team, you know, those in black shirts, they're, they're passing them back the, a basketball. And so they're really focused on one, one, two. And then right in the middle of this, this gorilla comes walking out. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? And just pounds his chest, pounds his chest really quick and then walks right off. So they get done with the study and they say, all right, how many times? And the people are like, 15. Yeah, that's great. Yes, it is. Did you see anything else? And more than half the time, the people will say no. They, they didn't see it. They missed the gorilla. In fact, it's funny. They'll even say um, there was a gorilla, you know, that walked in and pounded his chest and they, they won't believe it. And so they'll actually have to rewind the video and show them the gorilla that came in. And they're like, whoa, they're blown away. They can't believe that they missed it. Why? Because when we're focused on something and we're not paying attention to all the other things that are going on, it's called inattentional blindness. Okay, inattentional blindness. That means we're blind to anything we're not actively paying attention to. How, how often does that happen, right? You're on your phones and someone says something and right, or your, your husband or you, you're on the couch watching a basketball game and, and honey, they can't even hear you. You lose your sense of hearing because all your 40 bits are drawn to whatever you're, you're doing. So the same principle applies right to the present moment. If I'm, if I'm just kind of lost, then I'm not paying attention to the other things that are going on. What about this? So I took this picture when we were, uh, took the SRAM fam to San Diego went out to dinner at a Mexican restaurant. I look over and this dad's on his phone. The entire time this, the son is eating his, his dessert. It happened the other day. My wife and I um, took our, our son to Pizza Pie Cafe and this mom's on her phone. The entire time the kids are getting down, getting their own little thing. And they're just little kids, but no attention because it's all there. That means it's not on, on their children or our partner. Now, this is interesting because 
the same couple, they come and sit down in the same seats that that father and that son were at. And they sit down, they start pulling out their phones, which just drives me nuts. And then my kids are like, dad, you're not paying attention to us because you've taken pictures of everybody on your phones and you're on your phone. So like, oh man, yes, it, it consumes us, right? So inattentional blindness, I'm not paying attention because I'm paying attention to something else or work, right? If I'm focused on, on work, I, I'm not paying attention to others. Or if I'm focusing on something else, I'm not paying attention to work or driving. This happens all the time. So the, the whole point of this is what's our brain wired to focus on? What's our brain drawn to? It, it's threat and stress and negativity and trauma and everything else. It will consume you. If you don't take a step back and pause, take a, bit, a look at the bigger picture because our blinders are on and all we see is the white team passing, the white shirts passing the ball. We, we miss the gorilla or we miss our partner or we miss our kids or we miss the good stuff. There's great things happening. Even during the pandemic, there's great things that are happening in the world. So we get distracted easily. So do we focus on the, our favorite things, right? Raindrops on roses. Okay, I won't, I won't say whiskers on kittens, that whole thing. What are your favorite things? And our favorite things, they can only influence our mood if we notice them. So we have to notice them. And our, our favorite people can only influence us in our mood and our love and our appreciation for them only if we notice them. So one of my points is this, slow down and find the good and feel the good and feed the good, the slow down and just savor it for a minute, just to soak it all in for a second and stay with it. When something good happens, don't move on to the next task. Just celebrate it, even 10 seconds, because here's the principle. Negativity is like Velcro. It just sticks to your brain. And positivity, when something positive happens, it's like Teflon and it just comes and it just is gone. It just goes so fast. And we don't just hold on to it for a minute and talk about it. So in the SRAM fan, we do happy thought. At the end of the night, we celebrate the good, the happy, the fun things that we enjoy, the things that brought us, that made us happy that day. And so I start, my wife goes, and each of our children, they say one thing that made them happy that day. You can do it at dinner, dinner time, but you've got to find places to talk about the good, to notice the good, to feel, and then feed it feed the good to make it last longer and put it in your in your memory ultimately it's this there's things that matter and then there's things that i can control and if we can learn to focus on that middle part of things that matter all the rest is noise a lot of the stress we can't do anything about so focus on the things that matter and the things that can control and there's a little bit right there Make that something that you can do it about and something that really matters. I, I love that. So pay attention to those things. Give that your 40 bits. Not, not all this other distraction and all this other this stuff that's going on. So why, why do we react the way that we do? Okay, we're born with about 80, stick with me, right? We're born with about 86 billion brain cells called neurons. And so if, imagine, right, a newborn baby, some of you have newborn, new grandbaby or something. They're, when they're born, they're born with about that many. And then just like if it were to start raining on this big pile of dirt, that water would hit and then it comes down and it starts making these little channels, right? In this dirt. And that's the same thing that happens in, in babies and brain cells and neurons. The first few years are so important. The whole point of this is that we are wired early on to learn how to, um, to react, right? To stress. If you grew up in a very stressful and a hostile environment and there wasn't a lot of nurturing, then your brain is wired to respond to stress differently, differently than someone that was nurtured in this warm environment. They're wired differently. If you grew up with parents who were yellers, you're wired differently. If you were you know, born with others that didn't, you never saw your parents fight. Our brains are wired differently depending on our experiences our environment and what's happening. At the peak of this, I think it's pretty phenomenal. About 1 million connections every second, like when babies are one, two, three years old, all these connections are happening. Now, can we rewire the brain? Once you're wired and you've had all this trauma and, and these horrible experiences, thank goodness, yeah, yes. It's called neuroplasticity. And we used to think that we can't rewire the brain. We can rewire the brain but it takes time, healing, counseling, and then infusing things from a different perspective. So our genetics, talking about genetics even, 
about half of our happiness we inherit from our, our parents. So you can either thank or right, curse your, your parents for happiness. Genetics and depression, anxiety, other thing, mental health, a lot of it is, um, is inherited. So what about, the other, what about the other slice of that happiness? Well, about 10% is our circumstances. And that's even who you're married to. And your money, your car, your watch, the kind of home that you have, all that stuff, it plays a small role but not a lasting role. In fact, we get used to so, so many things. You get a new purse, right, ladies, or a new pair of shoes, and then it kind of wears off. 72 hours and it's gone. I need, need something else. Or you go to a hotel and it's great. The first day, second play, second day, third day, it's a dump, right? We get used to things so easily. So what about the, the 40%? This is the, the part that I get super excited about because this is intentional activity. These are your thoughts. These are your behaviors. This is what you get to control. You don't have much control over what happened to you as a child, but you have a heck of a lot more control on how you process what happened to you as a child and how much you, you go there. Uh, again, counseling and, and other help is, is important. So when the brain is positive, first talk about the benefits of, of a positive brain, I'll, I'll fly through some of these. So much happens in our brain. When it's positive, it turns on all the learning centers of the brain. We're more productive, intelligence rises, energy rises. And that last one, dopamine, it turns on, right? All the, the learning centers in the brain and we perceive things. And here's a key point. We perceive things as less stressful. When you are positive, you perceive things as less stressful. Yes, there's stress, but you've built up so much positivity in your, your brain that you see it differently. And I'll show you some, some of these. And so really what it's a matter of, of increasing positives in stress, decreasing what we can, the negatives, but increasing and boosting what we do have control over. And that's some of the positives that I'll talk about. So increasing the positives, decreasing uh, the negatives. Huge one uh, is gratitude. Now around the holidays, I saw all kinds of, uh, here in Utah, all kinds of posts on, on gratitude. And I loved it because the research here has is simply exploded on how wonderful gratitude is. Now, even if you're going through cancer, I had a great friend um, who went through horrible cancer and 20 bladder infections in, in two years, had his bladder removed. Okay, still found time to be grateful because gratitude is something that we get to control. I love that, the impact of gratitude. So what do I use? I use an amazing app. It's called the five minute journal app, okay? I love it, love it, because in the morning it says three things that you're grateful for at the end of the day, three amazing things that happened that day, and then I get to take a picture. I'm very visual, and so I take a picture of the day, and then it helps me remember what happened uh, that day. And then as I review that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this and this, and so it fills my mind with gratitude and happiness. Um, another great TED Talk, so put this one on your, your must-watch list. This is by um, a monk, David Steinel Ross, and he says this. He says, in daily life, we must see that it is not happiness that makes us grateful, but gratefulness that makes us happy. He says, gratefulness is the key to a happy life that we hold in our hands because if we're not grateful, then no matter how much we have, we will not be happy because we will always want to have something else or something more that we're not happy with our circumstances, but we can find something to be grateful for. Okay, that's like that's Instagram worthy, right? Post that on your blog, dang it. Gratitude, that, that's powerful. Okay, and now this one, this one is one of my favorites. This is by Dr. Robert Emmons and he's written, those two books are some of my favorite on gratitude. He says, we know from studies that gratitude helps us recover from loss and trauma. Whoa, whoa, whoa. what? That's what this, this whole symposium is about. Gratitude helps us recover from loss and trauma. It helps us to deal with the slow drip of everyday stress, as well as the massive personal upheavals in the face of suffering and pain and loss and trials and tribulations. He says basically everything. Gratitude is absolutely essential. It's part of our psychological immune system. Now, if we could put gratitude in a pill, our people would pay thousands of dollars to feel the happiness, to feel the effects of everything that I just showed on those other reduced thoughts of suicide even and reduce anxiety and stress, gratitude. And then he says it's it's psychological immune system. And so this, this is a key point because if we're, right, our minds, our hearts are full of gratitude, then when the negative stuff does come and it will, it will surely come, 
but we can process it differently already because we filled our minds with so much things that we're grateful for that it doesn't have quite the negative effect, just like we boost with the vitamins and veggies. And that's what gratitude is. And so it doesn't mean that we won't get sick or bad stuff won't happen, but we can recover faster with a stronger immune system. And that's the psychological immune system, gratitude. Okay. Another one is, is kindness, random racks, random acts of kindness. This is one of the most powerful things you can do. In fact, Martin Seligman, the father of positive psychology, he says, doing a kind act produces the single most reliable momentary increase in well-being of any exercise that they've ever tested. And so, and so try it, even try it right now, if you want, text somebody a random text of gratitude right now, just get on and be and say, Hey, you know, I sure miss your, your daughter or son in school. Just, you know, send them a text, um, a parent, a grandparent, a friend, send them a text right now of just pure gratitude, love, appreciation, and, and watch what happens. Okay. And I call this exercise, I call it text two before 10 text two people, before 10 a.m. and try it, try it for three days, seven days. You do it for 21 days, you'll be, you'll be hooked and you'll have increases in your resources because more people, you'll be going out to lunch with people, you'll be connecting and say, hey, yeah, let's catch up sometime. Random acts of kindness of all the things that they've, they've done, all the studies on happiness. He says, this one will improve your positivity because guess what? Have you seen a pattern here? Kindness is never about you. Gratitude is never about you. Stress and anxiety and all that, it's always about you and it turns you inward. But when you, when you can focus on other people and on doing good and being good and being grateful, then it sure helps battle, again, that psychological immune system that it, that it improves. Okay, another one, finding flow. Finding flow. Flow is that that time when you lose track of time because you're so immersed in, a, in an activity, right? So finding flow, and it could be gardening or playing the piano, doing something worthwhile. My dad, my dad is amazing. So my, if I could show you in here, right, the things that he's carved, he carves his ornaments, but he just carved and he lose track of time, I think, right? As he's doing all this carving. So finding some kind of a hobby, something that you, you love to do, yeah, it could be out on the slopes and it just time just goes so fast because you use all 40 bits. Remember the 40 bits? You use all 40 bits in that activity. Instead of like sitting, don't watch sit there and watch TV or scroll. That, that's not flow. That's a waste of time. Okay. So he says, um, Mihai Cheek sent Mihai. He says, it's a state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience is so enjoyable that people will continue to do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. So volunteering, the food pantry, getting involved, doing something, getting out of the chair, doing something that is so good for depression and stress and anxiety. He says the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times at the beach in Hawaii. Okay, those are good times too. He doesn't say that. He says the best moments usually occur if a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So I love that one. Okay, humor. Humor is another good, another good one, right? How many of you, the Bernie Sanders stuff, if you, if you can't laugh at some of that stuff and just learn to say, okay, yeah, yeah, this is funny. These are some of my favorites. And then you can see that I, I love this. I love, um, yeah, my wife's I'm gonna kill me. But this, this is my mask. She won't let me wear it at the store. But I love because, hey, why not? Why not see the brighter side of things? And so sometimes we'll jump on Zoom meetings for, for school stuff with our educators. And I'll dress up, as you can see, right? That Dr. Shram dog. And I just turn in. But it's important to find the lighter side of stuff. Because the research on laughter, smiling, humor, is amazing immediately look at this improves sleep and social bonds and anger and actually you live longer they've done studies on this people who are happier and smile and laugh and see the brighter side of things even during tough times now you can't always laugh at everything of course there's serious things then there's tragedy and there's sickness and there's death and divorce and horrible things but if we can at times learn to see the brighter and the humorous side of things okay exercise can reduce anxiety and stress by up to 20%. Uh, don't need to yeah, preach about that one. That one's, that one's huge. Mindfulness and meditation helps us to, right? Yoga even being able to be centered and relaxed because 
your mind doesn't tend to wander off on stress. It's the here and now in the present moment. And that's really what that's about is being in the present moment, taking some deep breaths instead of going drifting to the past. Because remember, the default mind is a wandering mind. And a wandering mind is not always the best place to be because it wanders to unhealthy things. It tends to, to those unhealthy areas in our lives. So simply, that's what Google, they have, they tell people to get off, right? They send a little text out, take your hands off your keyboard, close your eyes and just breathe, pay, count your breaths for two minutes and then put your hands back on the keyboard and work. These little hacks, they work. They work and they're for, for some people and they can be helpful. So three keys, three keys for a happier life. This is a view, I mean, from Cash Valley, right? We look at it on our, on our deck and we see this and you think, pause, just soak that in for a minute and just absorb it and then come back to dinner and, and later. But man, can't miss the, the good things that are happening. And the first one is find and process the gems in your past. Look past and maybe you had crummy past and there's trauma and betrayal and just horrific things. You can choose, you can choose, your 40 bits can choose to focus on that or you can choose to find the gems in your past. The good things, the great you know, experiences, the wonderful people in your past, uh, the experiences that bring you joy, focus on those. Look at a scrapbook or home movies, find the gems in your past. Second, learn to enjoy and find the good in the present. The happiest people I know, the happiest people I know have learned to enjoy their day have learned, learned to enjoy today. What's happened? What has happened? And that's why I love the five minute journal app. I can journal the great things that happened that day. A happy thought at night. Hey kids, tell us about the happiest part of your day. Okay. And looking forward with hope to the future. You got to have either, you know, it's a lunch day out with my friend or a vacation or a trip or a break or a ski trip, something, look, find something to look forward to plan something, have some plans to look forward to, because that brings us hope, relief. Yes, maybe you don't have to people get vaccinated or whatever it is, having something that we can go out and live life again. And it can, again, it can be, uh, you know, going out a walk in the park, something to look forward to and, and to plan. So how do we become better after the bitter? We turn to our resources, we turn to our resources and the best ones are the people. The, the family members, the loved ones, our community, our faith community, turn to the resources of, of what you have and practice positivity. It's real. Try it, right? I'm living proof. And I have bad days and there's stress, but then I can process it in, in healthier ways. And I perceive stress differently. My, my personality is more of a hey, you know, it'll be fine. It's going to be fine. I even have a shirt that says, I'm fine. You're fine. Everything's going to be fine. It's all fine. Be, be in, being able to, to see that, draw on your resources and, and perceive things. So let me, I, I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. He teaches, your mind is like a piece of land planted with many different kinds of seeds, seeds of joy, peace, mindfulness, understanding, and love, seeds of craving, anger, fear, hate, and forgetfulness. These many different kinds of seeds are always there, sleeping in the soil of your mind. The quality of your life depends on the seeds you water or I would say pay attention to. If you plant tomato seeds in your gardens, tomatoes will grow. Just so if you water a seed of peace in your mind, peace will grow. When the seeds of happiness in you are watered, you will become happy. When the seed of anger in you is, is watered, you will become angry. He concludes, the seeds that are watered frequently are those that will grow strong. And so I, I ask, as I wrap up, which seeds are you watering? Which, where's your 40 bits? Are you, are you in the past? Is it the future? Are you able to balance that and pay attention to the present moment? Choose. You choose your 40 bits of what you focus on and how you process things. So I, I've, here's some of Dave's face. Some people say, Dave, Dr. Dave, you know, I recommend some of my, here's some of my most favorite books. Now, The Upward Spiral, I added. That's my favorite book that I've ever read so far on stress and anxiety. I buy it, honestly, by the by the dozens. And I give it away. I give it away to people, I give it to students who are, because it's so down to earth, it's so practical and it's science backed. Um, Alex Corb, a great friend, he's at UCLA 
neuroscientist, but he doesn't write like one humorous, but th these science, and it's not a thick book. It's very down to earth. Our daughters, her teenage daughters have read it. It's very um, simple, simple little things that can actually create this upward um, spiral. Blinkist, Blinkist is an app. You can listen to these and all these other books, the 15 minute version of the book. I've listened to over 200 books on Blinkist. So it's 15 minutes um, of like the best of the best they take out of the book. And if I like it, then I buy it. So anyway, I like that one. Uh, between Parent and Child, one of the all-time great parenting books. So these are parenting um, books. If you're looking for something, man, I'm struggling with this. These are some of the, my, my go-tos uh, that I go to for, for parenting books. So we want to take a picture of, of that slide or whatever, but a lot of good information out there, but there's a lot of not so good information out there. I like the science backed stuff by, by scholars and researchers who say, yeah, this is the, this is the good stuff. Um, some of my favorite apps and uh, websites, podcasts to check out on happiness and positivity you see the five minute journal. That's what that one looks like. If you're looking for that, there's some imitators out there. I don't know how well they do um, live happy. Now happify the happiness lab. I'll get on the, the elliptical in the morning and just exercise and listen to some of these. And it's so good. It's such good information to, yeah, wow, kindness and compassion and finding meaning in life and purpose. That, that's what these are about. So if those are helpful, but let me wrap up with this. So meaningful words, right? These motivating words at the, the end of all this from our eight-year-old daughter. And if, if some of you have seen this, if you've seen me present before, but have you ever had that date when you just can't get your kids to bed fast enough? And you're just like, you know, get to your bed, stay in your bed, stay in your bed, stay in it. And you're like, you know, $20 bill for anyone who stays in their bed. You just get so stressed and you start to lose it and you start to lose it on your kiddos. And I, I did that. Okay. And I was, I remember in Missouri, we were there for nine years as a professor, four kids, you know, like eight, four, six to two, and just so stressed, like knock it off, stay in your beds. And then I go back to our room and I'm like regretting it. I'm like, ah, I'm frustrated as a parent. And then I hear it. I hear it. These footsteps are coming down the hall. And I hear it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to let them have it. And then I hear something on the door. And that's why I say, get back to your room. And I go back to their room. And I go to the door. And I open it up. And there's a note. There's a note from our eight-year-old daughter. And this is a picture of the actual note. And she says, thanks a lot. I know it can be hard being a mom or dad. But you got to stick with it. And I just remember thinking, oh, my gosh. Right here's Dr. Dave in 10 years of school. And I'm, yeah, and I'm happy. And I'm the best parent ever. And no, I blow it. I have bad days. And I have stresses. And they have my parents, or my parents, my, my parents are amazing. My children, they have to drive me nuts sometimes. But I says, look on the back. Do you see that on the notes? Look on the back. And so I turn the, back, the, the note over and read it. And it says, don't worry. We still love you. I think, oh man. So a lot of it is sticking with it. Is sticking, find one of these, these little happy hacks, these things that you can do. Try it. Try that upward spiral. Try to remember what you're focusing on, paying attention. Find when you're distracted and you're just kind of yeah, going through life. Some of the, sometimes that's good. I just need some downtime. I don't want to think about anything. That's great. In fact, yeah, downtime and some find that default mode uh, can be healthy. But wow, try, try some of this. To, especially during the still kind of uncertain times and things are still kind of shut down. I can't see my parents. Try some of that. Now, I, I, I post all kinds of um, happy stuff, parenting and marriage tips on my Facebook page, Dr. Dave USU, that you see there. Um, little video clips and Thrive in Five and, and two minute tips that I try to help bring happiness and hope and parenting tips, marriage tips to, to this, yeah, this world that, that really needs a lot of this dose. And again, the, the slides, all the slides, if you want any of that, go grab it at drdaveshram.com. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it back over to the team. And Dave, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is um, Dr. Dave's second time to present in the Community Resilience Symposium. He was in a breakout in 2019 and, and I didn't get to hear him that year. And so this was my first time to hear you, um, Dr. Dave. And I, but I already knew you were amazing. In fact, um, two of these that are gonna present virtually, Dr. Dave, and Dr. Susan Madsen, um, I received a text from a friend yesterday in Layton. She said, I can't wait to be in the symposium tomorrow. And I said, how did you hear about it? And she said, 
well, it was the flyer that you sent in your Christmas card. <laughs> And so 600 plus people got the flyer for the symposium because I send a lot of Christmas cards. And um, and all of the three of you presenters today have come, I mean, you're, you're very well known um, and we're just privileged to have you. So thank you so much. So we have Dr. Madsen with us next and I'll share a little bit about her. I, uh, I met her, <clears throat> In the Real Women Run, I went to one of the Real Women Run um, symposiums years ago. I'd already run for office, <laughs> and um, but I went and I, I learned everything I did right, and I learned a few tips for next time. Um, but she presented there, and she presents everywhere, and um, is remarkable. <clears throat> she has recently moved to our county, right? So we're super excited that she actually lives here close by now. So Dr. Susan Madsen is the inaugural Karen Haight Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership, um, also up at the John Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. Here's why I think she's pretty well known in our state and beyond is she's the founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project. It's a giant project and it's doing amazing work. So she, her, she wants to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. She's a, um, a global scholar. She's written a lot. She's done a ton of research. And she's been featured in the US News and World Report, The Atlantic, New York Times, Parenting Magazine, Chronicle of Higher Ed, Washington Post. She's a regular contributor to Forbes. She speaks globally. In 2019, she did keynotes in the United Arab Emirates, the UK, Lithuania, Germany, and Denmark. So a little bit of traveling. Um, and she, she serves in many nonprofits and many committees and boards and, and um, organizations. So she did receive a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University, master's from Portland State, and a doctorate. Her doctorate is from the University of Minnesota. But I believe you are a Utah native. Yes. Yes. Yes, I am. And we're just super thrilled, Dr. Madsen. Um, I'll let you, you know, intro really what you're sharing with us today. Um, but, but I said to her specifically, you know, we have some problems that I don't think you would expect to find in Davis County. And we have a good amount of problems that I don't think you would expect to find in Davis County. How can we prevent these problems? What is going on? And that is what she's going to share with us today. So I'll turn the time over to her. Thank you so much. So good to be here. Wish I could, wish it was in person and wish I could see each of you. Um, and, and I have to say, Dr. Dave, that's the first time I've heard you present and awesome. That was so engaging and so interesting. And some of the slides I've gotten into some of the neuroscience and different things and unconscious bias, they align so much with what I teach. So I have really appreciated uh, following you. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump in though. I have a lot of, of good information, much different than Dr. Dave. So I think you'll really appreciate the different perspectives and I'm sure Tyler will have different perspectives and information to bring as well. I wanted to talk today really about the strengthening individuals, families, and communities. And I'm calling this from awareness to action. One thing that is very, very clear is that you really can't do effective, effective action unless you really know what you're talking about. You can kind of shoot, the more you become more aware of what's going on, the more you can really make an impact. And so I, I really, that's why I'm calling it awareness to action. So I did want to mention uh, that the mission of the Utah Women and Leadership Project is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And we produce, we serve Utah and its residents by producing a number of things. We produce relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research. We create and gather valuable resources, 
And we also convene trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. In fact, last, set, last Friday, I interviewed uh, Sherry Dew leadership, and we have that video online as well. Just so you know, this closes on Sunday, but we also are doing a full study, over 3,000 responses so far, far and would love more on the impact of COVID-19 on Utah women and work. So we really do a lot of research around that. And I, I moved from Utah Valley University in July to Utah State University and work both with the Huntsman School and Extension. Now, I do want to say that occasionally, you know, I do all this girls and women work. Occasionally, I've had people say, uh, you do all this girls and women stuff. Do you not like men? I actually say, yes, I love them. I love my husband and three of my four children are uh, young men. And I have a, two grandchildren and one is a, a grandson. And then occasionally people will say, well, to do all this girls and women stuff, you must have been raised with a bunch of sisters. So I will show you a picture of my siblings. Yes, these, I do have six brothers. Three of them actually live over in Saratoga Springs. And interestingly, oftentimes when I show this picture, I'm teaching about unconscious bias and different things. But with this topic today, really the way we're raised, and I, I feel very privileged to be raised with um, all of us struggle in some way, but but if you compare me to a lot of families, I, I really feel so privileged to be in that situation. But all, everything we do from our upbringing, the way our brain is formed, like Dr. Dave talked about, really is Im impacts how we move forward and, and really how resilient we are and the kinds of resiliency we really implement. And so today, I know many of you joining really are concerned about these adverse childhood experiences because they have lasting negative effects, many of them on health and well being and opportunity as well. And these things can increase the risk of injury and sexual, sexually transmitted infections, maternal and child health problems, teen pregnancy, involvement in sex trafficking, and a lot of chronic diseases. And, leading causes of death since like cancer and diabetes and heart disease and suicide and so forth. So thinking about that as I move forward with this presentation, kind of keep that in mind because uh, it, you know, for, for, for children who are around this to have these experiences, but also for adults to, who have experienced those things and, and how they parent and the resiliency that they're, that really is in their homes. And one thing that I've really started thinking about and talking about more, I do a lot of work in Scotland and England and Wales and the UK. And for about 10 years, they have used this term and it's slowly coming over to the United States, but it's wicked problems. Now you might think, what in the heck are wicked problems? Actually, wicked problems are the really complex problems. And I guess it's what I want to say is these adverse childhood experiences are really what are called wicked problems, complex problems. They don't have a set answer, yes or no, do this particular thing and it will solve all the problems. And you can see in some of the writing, this is a quote from one of the scholarly journals, is more and more, and you can think of the pandemic today, of course, right? Um, the, this is a wicked problem because it's complex and it usually doesn't have these set answers. But the thing in the quote that really sticks out to me is the way we've been doing things in past years, kind of sometimes with some of these complex problems, especially as ACEs, there's that old thinking oftentimes doesn't work. There's new solutions, new kinds of things that we need to do at the individual level, at the family level, and in the community, and even in the world, where we've got to look outside our current box of thinking into really combining the energy of communities and innovative thinking to really do this. And I have to say, I talk often about sexism and racism. And sometimes people say to me, I'm tired. I'm tired of doing this work because it just feels like I'm not making progress. 
But I say, stay, you, we must stay the course. We must not let tiredness and discouragement halt the positive influence we and you today can have in all settings, especially when we look at these wicked problems. So today, what I want to do is really give you some stats to start. I'm going to go fairly quickly through this. Um, and then, some, then really talk about some underlying issues, particularly and then we see every place, but particularly as they relate to Utah and the culture I've been studying for many, many years. And then a big section really on some ideas for next steps that really align of some of them with, with what Dr. Day, very different than his presentation, but also some things in the community that, we'll, that we might be able to talk about. And then just a few slides to end. So that's my plan today. So first, what I want to do, I was really asked by the team who asked me to speak today to talk a bit about some things that are really troublesome in the state of Utah that really do affect resilience in individuals. And then it impacts family, communities, and, and so many. When things happen to one person, you think about suicide, it, the layers and layers and, and the circles outward of people that are impacted by those things. Just, it, it's, it's, I, I mean, awesome sometimes to think about the, the drop sometimes that happens and how it really moves out to so many people and with these kinds of things in very negative ways. So I really wanna talk and give you some stats on three core things. The first is sexual assault specifically in Utah. The second is domestic violence. And then those were the two I was asked, but I put in a third. I won't tell you what it is right now, but I'm really troubled by it and feel like it um, really impacts resilience in the state of Utah, particularly in families. And so, I, you know what, I've been talking about, and, and these stats actually have a new team of researchers that will be in the next probably three months, we'll have an updated version. These are about three or four years old. I think things will be changing and, and I hope not in the negative way, but, but I'm wondering. So in terms of stats, a lot of people in the state of Utah do not understand that we are actually, this is not great in Utah. We're well above the national average on sexual assault and rape. And this has been going on for a long time. And as you know, when and, and I work closely with the Unique Foundation. If you don't, if you haven't heard of them, please look them up because they do. They're they're more national and moving into global. They really do work to with women specifically to help men them heal from sexual assault and rape when they were children, and the impact still when they're 40 and 50 and 60 years old on those childhood uh, experiences. Uh, affects everyone in their lives. So it is a serious concern in Utah and in the nation. Utah women, one in three, have been sexually assaulted. One in six have been raped. One in two women will experience sexual violence victimization during her lifetime. Research is clear that the long-term negative effects uh, of sexual assault on girls and women and boys and men, women and girls is what I really work with. And, and of course we see that much more the sexual assault with girls and women, impact children and impact families. So here are just a few of what sexual violence include, unwanted sexual acts, including flashing, being forced to observe sexual behavior, being coerced to show their own body parts, being aggressively harassed in public and, and many more. And if you want some more information about some current data that was is just out nationally, and I wrote about it in this editorial, um, one in five Utah girls were sexually assaulted last year alone and that has to stop. You know, I've been talking about this for years and other people, wait, this is enough. This is enough. We've got to do something more. So how does Utah stack up? It's the only violent crime where Utah's rate is above the national average. In Utah, rape is well above the national average. All other violent crimes are lower. That's it. That's, that's the, the one above. And Utah has the 12th highest, and, and I'll be interested to look at the newest data, sexual assault rate in the nation. Sexual assault, 
report it to police. And of course, so many people don't don't report it, but according to actually what, what data we do have, only 12% in Utah, while the nation is about 34%. So the research is telling us that less people, less spe specifically women and girls, are not reporting compared to the nation. So there's some dynamics that you can talk about related to that. Put a few things on for campus sexual assault. 90% of, of women who specifically were assaulted on campuses knew their attackers before the assault. And the majority of college rapists um, are serial um, and commit an average of six rapes before they're being caught. Now, common beliefs don't tell the whole story. Actually, 87% are assaulted by someone they know. I don't think I have this percentage on, on, on a slide, but what we know, and, and we have on everything I'm gonna talk about, if you go to my website, utwomen.org, there's the full reports that are four pages for, for many of them. So 10% uh, of sexual assaults use weapons, 27 uh, include additional physical injury, only 13% seek medical care after their attacks. One in three survivors seek counseling and only 1% contact a rape line. And so many things about the cost of sexual violence. This is an estimate, of course, but sexual assaults cost billions and proactive. So you can look at this and see the perpetrators, 92 million. Uh, survivors, much less, and prevention, very, very small. Each year, sexual violence costs in Utah are estimated, and this is older data, $5 billion. You can see that in our research, you know, we see that violence across everyone, but definitely women with lower income have uh, more assault and uh, less education. Um, and there are so many public uh, research sources on this that, that are available. So let me go back. I've clicked too much. I want to shift over to domestic violence now. And what we know is from the data that we're seeing coming out, especially in 211 and some different kinds of data, that there is, and this won't be a surprise because you've probably heard it on the news nationally, that there is more domestic violence during the pandemic. Uh, people more are spending more time together in the home and especially those volatile relationships, you just see that more. It's a serious, it's widespread. In the state of Utah, one in three Utah women will experience some form of domestic violence in her life. And domestic violence can be physical, emotional, verbal, sexual, spiritual of domestic violence. 40% of actual adult homicides are domestic violence related and 21% of female domestic violence victims have been in multiple abusive relationships as well. So how do we stay, you know, stack up to the nation? Um, our rate of domestic violence is higher than the nation for adult women, but slightly lower, at least the reported uh, for all youth and male, uh, males and females. And so you can see the difference here between youth and adult, the youth being in blue, 10% in Utah, um, seven, or 7% 7 in Utah, 10% in the nation, although some of the newest data is not playing out this way. And then you can see in terms of adults. So Utah was ranked 11 in the nation for the uh, prevalence of, of domestic violence. Sorry, it's flipping a little bit quickly. Maybe I'll use my arrows um, and they're not working. So there we go. Okay, some risk factors. While domestic violence can happen to anyone, a number of factors are associated with higher rates uh, in terms of marital, marital status, divorced and separated women, in terms of education, less than high school education is the highest, and of course, lower income women, you do see more domestic violence rates. The impact on children and teens in Utah when there's domestic violence, it, as I mentioned before, doesn't only uh, affect the survivors, but friends and neighbors and families, particularly the children. 34% um, of adult survivors witness domestic violence as children. 80 
Utah children are present at the murder or attempted murder of their mother each year. And you can see 11.8, and there's some new data again that just came out um, that we're gonna update pretty, pretty soon. And about 3,000 men, women, and children stay in domestic violence shelters. What we know, and I know this in, in Davis County, but other counties as well, that the, the shelter have been full during the pandemic. There's a lot of costs associated with that and an estimated cost of 8.3 billion uh, based on domestic violence in the United States each year. But you can see some of the other uh, costs specifically with the domestic violence survivors dissatisfied, they're more dissatisfied with their life, lack social and emotional support, poor health, and often miss work. Now, this is the third category. I gave you a little bit of a teaser about before, but one of the things I've really been reading about um, and doing some deep thinking about for many years, but really recently, is our high, fairly high rate, actually quite high rate of cosmetic surgery among Utah women. Uh, how does Utah step up? Actually, the research and some of the research is very interesting to look at. They look at how much money is spent on beauty products in Salt Lake City versus other cities. Look at that, 10 times as much spent. Utah has the sixth highest number of plastic surgeons. And one study, 66% of Utah women who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints know someone, and this is actually five years old. And I expect it's different now who has actually undergone cosmetic surgery. Um, and there really is a link between cosmetic surgery and body image. And uh, in fact, there's a new book that just came out. I haven't finished the whole thing yet, but it's called More Than a Body, the best book and the deepest book, especially on girls and women on body image. And I'll tell you, um, when you connect that to resiliency, there's a real negative uh, connection. So the more you struggle with social media and everything, I don't have time to really talk about all that, but the more women struggle and girls with uh, body image issues, uh, the less they are resilient in so many ways. So 80% of women in the US, and I, I, again, some of the data is this one's probably five years old, and I would think right now it's, it's even higher now, of women in the US do not like uh, how they look. Basically, there's another statistic that that is about 10 years old that said 81% of 10 year old girls are afraid of being fat. So already at 10 years old. So 92% of cosmetic surgeries and procedures are undergone by women. And interestingly, the Mountain Pacific region uh, is the highest in the nation. Researchers have found that when you have a homogeneous society like Utah, you can actually have higher levels of cosmetic surgery and higher levels of lack of satisfaction of your body. And so when we have, and this is changing, but it's you know been in the past year, so many white people and so many members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, actually that feeds into uh, why, one of the reasons why we have such high levels of dissatisfaction. And by the way, I don't think I have this on a slide, but one of the studies really said, and we see this as well, that we are so high in terms of parents actually giving breast augmentation sur uh, surgery as a gift for high school graduation. And if you don't, I wish, uh, you know, a lot of times when I say that and I, I see faces, there's some uh, disturbing trends with that. So many white people, more white people get that surgery and uh, even searches online for breast augmentation are higher than the nation significantly. And then, you know, a key concern for many Utah women are members of the Church of Jesus Christ as Latter-day Saints is finding a mate. And so some sources report that there's just more women in the, in the Latter-day Saint religion and only like three per two. And so those external uh, the things of validation, the physical beauty really connect with, with women trying to be external and, instead of internal. And, and I've said before very bluntly, if, if 
women, you know, there's, there's reports that girls are starting to save money up even during teenage years for this surgery. And if we could just switch that to thinking about their brain and their learning and really use that kind of money to prepare for college, to go, get to college and then to graduate from college, we'd be much better shape. So those are the three main elements of statistics that I wanted to share because there's really a connection then to that, the theme of the conference, which is resilience. Um, because when we are struggling with being sexually assaulted or the domestic violence being in the home uh, in terms of, of having that really in our faces all the time. And by the way, I uh, have a research team for this COVID study that I'm doing right now. And I was do doing some training. I have actually three research teams that are taking pieces of it. And I was doing some training with four uh, women uh, earlier this week who are going to be looking at the qualitative responses. And so I looked at some of those responses and started reading them. And I will tell you that I shed many tears already just looking at the first like 10 and the stories of women who feel like they're in these domestic violence, who, who perceive this violence almost every day. And that resilience, I mean, they hang in there and that's what they can do for their children. One of them talked about just being so close to suicide, but she knew she had to stay on this earth for her children. And no hope for really a better life because she feels like she doesn't have support to get out of that relationship. So as you can, can imagine, for those of us that don't experience these things, we've got to do something more to help build the resources, to help with more public policy. So, so those people that have really struggled with domestic violence, sexual assault, other things as well. But I'll tell you, I'm just convinced through this new research that's coming out about body image and, um, and the struggles that that really, when we're struggling about how we look almost every day and how we're showing up to the world, it goes against what Dr. Dave's talking about. That resilience goes down. Those negative influences just bring us down all the time and bring stress in that comparison that we're always doing between here's where I am and here's where, where my neighbor is. Or that comparison can be really difficult. So the more we can provide supports, the more that that we can lift and, and really take some of those things that are happening that some of us are invisible to because they're not part of our lives. But then take women and men who have experienced this kind of violence and, and put more resources towards helping them so that we can build that resiliency in women and men, I should say, which then builds that resilience within family systems and then communities, neighborhoods, and then communities and so forth. I do want to mention that I have much, uh, so much other research um, out there that really do have an impact on, on, on this topic as well. I won't go into this, but I want to just give you a taste. Um, in our original research, which are published in our briefs, we have things that relate, our briefs that relate to STEM and business leaders, political leaders, women in office, nonprofits, government, education, state boards and commissions, college attendance, flexibility. We have others as well. I just put some of these up here. So some of you might say, how, how does this relate to really strengthening our communities and so forth? I don't have time today to talk about it, but I speak about this so often that when you have more equal numbers of men and women working together to make decisions for companies, for our political, in our state legislature, in our city council, on boards and commissions making those decisions. What we know is this, and the research is so strong, it is just continuing to mount to support the statement that diversity matters in terms of gender, race, and those things. And the worst decisions that are made are, are when women are absent. We still have subcommittees generally. I, I don't know about this year, but as of last year in our state legislature and other places that don't have any women's voices. And what we know is when you have men and women working together, you have more innovation, you have more creativity. The problem solving is better. The decision making is 
better, and on and on and on, on the decisions that are being made. Okay, connection's not great. So hopefully you're all hearing me, still good. Um, so sorry about that. So we also have a lot of different snapshots. Oh, I was gonna point out as well. I want you to see my elephant picture. So I feel like sometimes I'm the one that's kind of pushing things along in the stage, just kind of tapping people uh, to move forward. Here's, here's another picture of an elephant just hanging out. Lots of different, I'm gonna move, move along, but lots of different kinds of things that really do impact a lot of Utah families, if not all in some way. I've talked about the three that I mentioned. Sometimes we're hanging out there, but there's so many things that we need to do in the state of Utah to really lift women, lift families in so many ways that do impact really our resilience. And so I think about those two elephants, but I love this. And sometimes we get teary I haven't talked about it too much, but I really do love this because this is a picture, if you look online, about uh, when a, an elephant, a female elephant is having a baby. What the other female elephants do is just protect them. And some of these little baby elephants could be males. So I'll put males in there, females and males, that they get in a circle and just back in to protect the, the female elephant that's having a baby so that predators don't get to her uh, and the new baby. They can smell it, so they just protect. And I just feel like maybe we've got to do that more. We have got to circle in. We have got to protect people that are vulnerable and figure out solutions that to these wicked problems that really are, um, really complex in our society today. And so the, uh, so much, the more we're aware, the more we're aware of the topics I brought up, but also other topics as well, the more we take invisible things that have, that have been invisible to us and bring that visibility up, the more we talk to our neighbors and friends and get behind some of the efforts, the better our families will thrive, the better individuals will thrive. And I, Really, uh, we've been often, and if you look at where the funding is, there's been so much more funding on the reactive instead of the proactive. And there's, when you look at best practices on many of these issues across you know, the United States, there really are best practices that can help communities become more resilient. And in terms of more proactive, um, instead of just doing reactive, now I want to spend a few minutes on some of the foundational elements. And then I want to put a lot more of my time, and I'm looking at the time, the time always goes quickly for me, but I'll stay, stay within my time frame. But some, some of the foundational elements really, really serve around this bias. Dave talked a little bit about that, but this cognitive bias, there's so many things that we really are not aware of unless I do unconscious bias training, deep unconscious bias training. And I'll tell you, it's changed me. The more that we bring again, invisible to visible, the more we can actually be uh, more impactful and it empowers us. Change means getting out of our comfort zones, being willing to learn and grow and work hard. I, uh, this, this cartoon is, you know, well, as someone saying, hey, if, if we, you know, don't change it all, just something will magically happen. No, that doesn't happen. It takes work. I don't know if any of you, I, I read a lot of editorials for both the Deseret News and the Salt Lake Tribune and some other papers as well. But um, if you haven't, this is a, a one that you might want to read. Basically, they changed the title. So I didn't love the, the title, but the title, if you look in the, I know this is a busy slide, but I had the, the danger of a single story. And this is a YouTube, we're on a YouTube um, kind of thing today with, with Dr. Dave's videos. But if you haven't seen us, powerful, that we, with unconscious bias, oftentimes we see one situation, one thing, like we meet one person from Africa. So then everything, maybe that person was poor and really struggled with this and this. So in our minds, everybody from Africa fits that picture. So you can look at some of the bullets. You know, we assume that families are composed of a mother and father and children. That's what's around our, with, with our neighborhoods. And then we ignore the many varied 
permutations of families. Uh, we, we, so this is at the heart of some of our work and, and assumptions that we make. And I think it's really dangerous when we don't learn more about our biases, when we just make assumptions. That to me is at the foundation. If we make us an assumption that everyone that's experiencing domestic bias, because we don't know that much about it, maybe we haven't experienced, has done something wrong or has had a certain situation in their lives. We're gonna not be able to help and lift and really help, you know, do things that really lift other families and people in our society. So think about that, the danger of a single story and our minds do that so much. And at the root of that really is this unconscious bias, which is really mental connections or associations without awareness, intentions or control. And we're, it's called implicit bias as well. And this is one of my top, top recommendations to people today is to really start reading and studying that because it has changed my life. When I understand I am a better parent, I am a better community member, I'm a better church goer because I have had a journey for the last seven or eight years uncovering my biases and becoming less judgmental. I still have a lot of work to do. Let's just leave it at that. Um, also, there's some interesting dynamics with the Utah culture that I really believe kind of moves into some of this trying to keep some invisible. What we know from the research is quite clear that in more religious societies, actually certain things happen. And, and there's, I, I won't tell you about the whole studies, they're so fascinating, but there's really some great studies just this past year being conduct, have, have just been published on religious societies in general. And a couple of things have happened. What they have looked at in every state in the United States, that more religious societies actually have less women in power. And so you don't get those benefits from men or women look, working together. You also see that in more religious societies, there's actually more sexual objectification, which fits into my data on, on um, cosmetic surgery. Now, I love being in a religious society. I do love it. I'm very religious and spiritual myself. But what I know is we have to, we can't put our blinders on. We need to actually see and take all that good that comes from a religious society and then move on things that, that are sometimes just reactions to things or things that are just so interesting. The, the conservative heart, there was another study last year that came out that looked at conservative uh, CEOs around the United States, and they could tell if they were conservative or not by how much money they donated to certain things. And what they actually came down with very specifically was that more conservative CEOs, when you looked at their companies and looked at them, they had significantly more sexual harassment and gender-based lawsuits. So there's some dynamics that play in, it's not easy, they're wicked problems, complex problems, but I just wanted you to be aware that there's some interesting things and the more that we're aware, the more we can change things. I really think we have such an interesting opportunity right now to change things moving forward. I have another editorial that says there can be an inclusive face to conservatism. But why do, do, do you know, basically liberals get the let's support women and conservatives are not. And I'm like, as a conservative, generally, I'm, I'm more of a moderate in Utah because I believe that women should be supported, which shifts me into the moderate. But uh, why I was taught to be kind and lift all people and be charitable and those things, which is part of my own religion. And I think, I think equality and equity can be such an important thing that really does influence families. That unequal dynamics in some homes, and that's not just religious, it's other states as well, between a man and a woman. There's some wonderful work that is being done right now on partnerships between men and women. And when that those partnerships are out of whack, that's when more domestic violence, that's when more confidence goes down, and especially in the women. So also, uh, you know, the things that I talk about specifically for women, in perfectionism, some of the things we've been socialized to do since we're 
girls. In fact, there's a big difference when you look at the real difference between how boys and girls are socialized in their upbringings. And girls are socialized more towards um, perfectionism. And we as women and girls really struggle even more than men with imposter syndrome, with rumination, with um, uh, really thinking that that women should even understand their strengths. I, I work with women all the time. And often they say, well, it would be, not be humble if I talked about my gifts and strengths. And actually what the research says is the more we know and understand our gifts and strengths, and I would say this to men too, the more we contribute, can contribute in more meaningful ways in this world. And so, and, and I've, I've noticed particularly in, in my religion, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there's such a difference between understanding of culture and doctrine that plays out. I still have people saying to me, well, my daughters don't need to get their college education because they're just going to be moms. And I'm like, oh, that is so <laughs> not according to the doctrine that I, I know and, and other things. So there's some cultural things that are that we still have to wrestle with. And then um, I, I have this slide just to remind us. Actually, I'm going to skip through this slide. Um, just I'm looking at the time and I want to get plenty of time on the last section. So um, also, the, you know, some of the foundational things between in thinking really about resilience in individuals and families. Some of you may not like this word, and I didn't used to like this word, and I still don't love it, but um, I talk about it more, that understanding the subtle nature, the obvious nature, but then some subtle uh, things of benevolent sexism, I'll tell you, that is, that's a game changer for some people. Um, and it, there's some confidence issues that tie into that, that really, if we do something more with this sexism. I wish I had more time to just talk about this and wrestle with it because it has absolute connections with resiliency in families, especially when there's a man and a woman in the home, um, in, the, in those relationships. Also, there's biases around race and age and disability and other things as well that come into play. And then I talk to women specifically a lot about confidence. And I think that's one of the foundational issues as well. Um, the difference between self-esteem and self-efficacy and optimism, um, confidence is different. It's about action. You can't get more action. You can't actually get more confidence unless you act. But the big one I wanted to comment on um, and, and here's an arrow and action. That's what I just talked about. The big one I wanted to comment about this particular slide though is about self-compassion. This ties into a few things that Dr. Dave said. One of the things I've noticed, particularly with women, but I think, I think we'll see this with some men as well, is that often women said, say, I'm not good enough. And they beat themselves up for, for not living up to this ideal. But what the research says is that actually makes you less resilient, less confident, that when you have self-compassion, when you say, I'm good, I'm good, I maybe, maybe, you know, something went wrong, but I'm going to forgive myself, I'm going to feel that compassion for myself, that actually is what brings more resilience and more confidence. Generally speaking, evidence shows that women are less self-assured than men, have more self-doubt, have more anxiety leaving their comfort zones, overthink and don't let go of defeats or mistakes as quickly, have hurt feelings longer than men, judge themselves harder than men, take longer to get started after failure, don't use failure to learn as well as men, and beat themselves up. And this is actually fashion. So I know folks listening in are interested in, in elements around boys and girls. Also, I, I do mostly with girls and women, like I said. But when you look at the confidence issues and how prominent there's a direct link to actual um, resilience and gaining confidence and really being, like I said, resilient. And then um, there's some gender. I'm going to skip this. Actually, I'm looking at my time. I had way too much, I, I guess. But a few other things to just be aware of. Sometimes that either or mentality that I can do this or that, there's some connections to the 
the resilience there. I already talked about banks. I'm not being humble. So I talked about that. And this consistent socialization around women being selfish, selfless, and what that looks like, that actually has some connections. You have to be so careful with that. Some of the connections to less resiliency as well. So let me get to this third step, which is my, my big chunk. And I just have a few slides at the end. But so what can we do? Now, in terms of the sexual violence, we need to teach children about consent and healthy relationships. We need to believe and assist women who report sexual assault. We need to support agencies working to help survivors and seek stronger investigation and enforcement uh, efforts. In terms of domestic violence, let's learn the facts about domestic violence. Let's teach boys and girls about healthy relationships, support domestic violence programs and services. And in terms of this negative body image, invest in women's educational efforts, focus on traits beyond physical appearance. Let me just tell you, that's hard sometimes. And I have a whole spiel about how we start when they're babies talking about girls' looks over and over. And you still see that when a husband in a kind way says, here's my beautiful wife. It's so interesting to look at that. Focus, uh, strength and confidence through overall health as well. And then I wanted to let you know about this resource that we developed, I had a team that developed and I do the webinars. We have four one hour webinars specifically on understanding gender. Not, I mean, it looks at boys and girls, young men, young women, in-depth exploration for educators and parents. I will tell you, the more you understand the differences between genders, the more you're empowered to actually teach differently, teach, and you might say, wait, that's, that's not what we want. We want everything equal. Actually, the latest research says that trying to be gender blind or race blind is not the answer and it doesn't work. Um, in these videos, we do talk about social and emotional learning, specifically in the schools and in the homes. And there's great evidence to show there's some, some uh, positive trends that happen when we, we do that kind of learning and that information. One of the things that I believe I talk about in, in this uh, series as well is the gender and dating violence, some real specifics on that that is good. Those can be tools to help us really lift families and communities and help kids when they're younger really not get into some of those situations where they have sexual violence. And this slide, I just want to remind us all that all of these things don't necessarily look the same when we look at ethnicity and culture and race, and we need to have those things in mind as well. And then really learning and understanding, I have some of this in this webinar series as well, the risk factors for home environments. Again, my website is utwomen.org and then you can get to resources and curriculum if you're interested in this. All of this learning, I'm a big learning and development person. So the more we learn, the more power we have to uh, really move our lives forward, but to lift and work with others as well. So the value in understanding gender differences is so that we can teach to the advantage of boys and girls and teams positive learning environments, whether that's in our homes or communities or other places as well. Another thing in terms of moving forward, things that we can do, I thought you'd like this. <laughs> that's supposed to represent communication, learning to communicate. When we look at the research around uh, couples uh, that, that are in domestic violence kind of relationships, it's the communication, learning to talk, learning to communicate between men and women or, or in, in other kinds of homes or with parents and children. Um, and I put this on here because people like Dr. Dave, I have this extension thing. I am amazed, I'm just learning about extension, how many things are available for very low cost and most of them for free. And there's many uh, things offered, uh, workshops and different things through extension. I would uh, take advantage of those things. And then teach the importance um, to people around us, to our children, to our grandchildren of adaptability 
and change and growth and lifelong learning skills help develop this, these resilience you know, abilities in children, youth, and adults and find joy in the journey. And I'm always talking about change. The more we find joy in changing and approving ourselves, the better actually we can do to respond to the pandemic and other things that'll come our way or to respond to things that happen in our families. But finding, I still feel, I, I still see so much defensiveness when things come up. Oh, don't tell me I need to change. Don't tell me, you know, I need to do something different instead of welcoming that in. So we need to do that more and more. And one way to do that, I am talking more and more about, and this is the mindset book. Many of you are that are on probably are not in your house by Carol Dweck. She's got a TED, TED talk as well. But I will tell you, there's when you get to that book, it will tell you so much more. That book, that growth mindset, the fixed mindset, when you, and we're not all perfect in one or another, sometimes we slip over to the fixed mindset. I can tell by people's language, like my students, where they're, where they're at on that continuum. The more we can consciously and work towards that growth mindset in ourselves, and in that book, there's so many interesting things about how we say things to our kids and really the difference between praising praising uh, ability, fixed ability, and praising effort and how powerful it is when we praise that effort instead of that fixed ability. Yet I truly believe that we actually do more towards girls with that fixed ability, you are beautiful, you are smart, you are, it's like you are already, so then you fail a math test, and then you're not good, at, you're not smart anymore, you're done. Instead of that effort, which I think we do a little more towards boys, you worked hard, or you, you know, you did that effort, so anyway, so much more to this topic, and I love this, um, this is uh, so important, one of the things I've done elements of research around this for years. And every time I do new studies and dig into just a piece of this, uh, it's confirmed to me over and over the importance of for ourselves, but teaching our children how to reflect, how to learn, how to change with that. There are lessons in everything. And if you are fully deployed, you will learn most of them. Experiences aren't truly yours until you think about them, analyze them, examine them, question them, reflect on them, and finally understand them. The point is to use your experiences rather than being used by them. To be the designer, not the design, so that experiences empower rather than imprison. I, this is just so important. So think about that um, instead of you know, I, I mean, there's ways to respond, especially to teenagers, but kids on what did you learn from that as you're driving in a car, if we do that again. Um, pandemic, I don't drive nearly as much. And then um, I love this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. There is power in community. There is power in civil dialogue. There is power in action. And there's power in advocacy. If we really care about building resilience in our families and in our communities, what I'm seeing more and more, I've been working in the state of Utah, pushing things along for women and gender for a long time. What I believe very wholeheartedly is that it is time. for more of us to have that confidence, to gain that confidence, to use our voice. And I talk to women mostly about this, but I think we need more men. In a civil, respectful way to figure out, to commune, to meet, and to figure out how we can do better in Utah, how we can solve some of these wicked problems that's out there. And it's amazing how one voice, two voices together, three voices, and then more can actually change things. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it at the legislature. I'm seeing it different places where I'm at. And there's more. What's so cool is there are more people that are 
are interested in using their voice, but there's so many more up and really be a force for good in our communities. Things are gonna change overnight. Things are gonna change. A couple slides to conclude. I've got that baby elephant reminder there. So think about my picture of kind of rallying the troops to protect people. That's important. But what I have on this particular slide is the tap or the nudge. Often people don't think they're prepared to run for office, don't think they're prepared to use their voice in different ways. And the research, especially around women, is if we tap their shoulder, if we just give them the nudge, you can do this, you can do that. It's amazing how we can move forward in our lives. And I'll conclude with this. I love this. It's from the Hopi Nation. Here is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid, who will try and hold on to the shore. They are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river and keep our heads above water. And I say, see who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. For we are the ones we have been waiting for. I love that last part. We're the ones. We're the ones listening in today. We're the ones hearing. We're the ones that we've been waiting for. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It is ours. And when we do so, then we can really unleash the goodness of people in our own families, in our extended families, in our neighborhoods, in our church groups, in our communities, in our state, to really have more people thrive and more people really reaching their potential. I, I'll tell you that I am so committed to the work that I'm doing to try to lift girls and women specifically, but I absolutely believe that if we lift girls and women, we're also lifting families. We're also lifting boys and men. And that's what we need in the state of Utah. There is too much in terms of domestic violence, sexual assault, unkind language, <laughs> um, rudeness to each other, that I believe that the key is to moving forward in productive way is those civil conversations and using our head, our knowledge, increasing our knowledge of the things that we're talking about and then putting our hearts into that and then doing something, actually getting our hands, using our head, our hearts and our hands. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been good talking to you. Susan, thank you so much. It's been good. Thank you. I don't want to create echo. There we go. Marcy, um, can you just, oh, I know you're, there's a person in here who's behind all of the good human services work in all of Davis County. <laughs> can you just come up here real quick, Marcy? I've already had COVID. Uh, it was mild. <laughs> Health department says uh, with masks on, you can still have side hugs. <laughs> um, Marcy Clark has been honestly a, a powerful force for all of human services. Everyone in the room who's worked with Marcy understands this. And um, so now I'll distance from you. <laughs> Are there any questions or things that we need to address that have been coming up? She and Mike Pace have been watching the chat. Um, you think no, we're good? I think we're good. Okay. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that kind of got to me a little bit there. Powerful. And, um, and we're not done. So <clears throat> I learned something in last year's 
Community Resilience Symposium that I had never heard of before. And it came from this speaker who's coming up next. He was, I think our closing keynote um, last year. I had never heard of shame resilience. So again, remember I said, I hope that from each one of these speakers, there's one thing that kind of changes us that we know to, that's what we needed to hear today. And um, last year, that was that was one of my things. And and I I think I it wasn't even necessarily um, for me only that I felt it. I felt it for the community. I felt it for people who all you know all of us have some sort of struggle or people we're close to who have a struggle um, with addiction or vulnerability. And, um, you know, we all have it. We have it in our families. We have it in our communities, tons of it. And I made a connection last year that um, shame resiliency is very important. And it's, it's, it's important for us. So Tyler was the one who taught us last year about that. And we, um, we wanted him to come again. So his title is what children teach us about being shame resilient. And um, Tyler is an LMFT, what is that? <laughs> Licensed marriage and family therapist, there we go. Um, known as the wandering therapist, is that kind of your yeah. cool icon? So a little bit about his background. Tyler is the co-founder of Love Strong and the clinical director of ADDO, A-D-D-O recovery in Logan, Utah. Um, again, What's all this connection to Cash Valley today? But uh, some cool things happening there. So, um, as a marriage and family therapist, Tyler has dedicated his career to mastering an understanding of recovery from shame based addictions and shifting to this is an acronym wholehearted living. He believes that the men and women who embrace and live the principles of recovery do far more than just get their own lives back. They become the best kinds of husbands and wives, fathers and mothers and individuals. So a little about Tyler, he shared his story last year on stage and it was powerful. He has been married for over 18 years to an incredible woman and is a father to four amazing daughters. Uh, you understand girls and women, <laughs> but uh, he fills a life work to, to men and boys, um, which is, is very important for resilience as well. So his hobbies away from work include um, supporting his children's interests, fly fishing, backpacking, and training. River, um, River the German short hair pointer, I'm a dog person too. Tyler is here in person. So we'll bring on Tyler up. Chase is like his assistant, kind of like Marcy is my assistant. And uh, so thanks again to Mike for making it all work with in-person and virtual. And I know you will love this presentation. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Uh, I am so grateful to be here with you guys today. I, do I need to stand somewhere for the camera? Okay, we're, we're and you are there in here. Right here. You, are, you are in a okay. <laughs> All right. I, I am. As I said, I'm grateful to be here today. I think it's such an amazing thing that we can still meet today. And I know that there's hundreds of people attending right now, and yet there's a few of you people in the room. And unfortunately for you people in the room, it might get a little uncomfortable at times because I usually present as more of like a workshop style. And lucky for you, it's COVID, so you won't be giving each other hugs. Otherwise, we'd probably be having a big group hug by the end of this thing. Um, but I am excited to be with you today. I'm grateful for the other presenters. I feel so lucky to come to these events and to be able to present. And I think one of the best things about presenting for me is, is that I get to just soak in the knowledge of the other presenters. I think you've done a great job putting together a great conference with really great information. And I just feel really fortunate to be here today. So. We're still pulling up our slides for a second, but I, in preparation for this, I was thinking about childhood and I'm a father of four daughters and my daughters refer to my jokes as dad jokes, right? And they, they always like roll their eyes with these dad jokes and they say things like that, that's really stupid, but I know that they, they like it. And then they end up going and like sharing it with their friends and then they think they're funny when they say it, yeah. right? So I wanted to start off today with you guys to just kind of get in the spirit of being with kids. like. 
a couple of some dad, some dad jokes. And if nothing else, you'll be able to leave this presentation with a few more dad jokes that you can get, go share with like, the kids in your lives, all right? So you get something of value out of this presentation, all right? The first, the first joke for you guys who, who are in attendance here is, um, hold on, there I'm, I'm blanking. There it is, why do ducks have tail feathers? You guys probably heard this one before, right? Never. <laughs> to, cover, to cover their butt quacks. <laughs> for those of you guys who are attending online i know this is hard like when you do like stand-up comedy with nobody in the room there's like this echo in there right so if you want to you can like chat in as, as you want with with the laughter right here's the second one is uh what does a gangster warlock say when he does a magic trick abracabada bing abracabada boom <laughs> and we'll do one more for you the last one is, what did the Buddhist say when he, <clears throat> when he walked up to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. <laughs> so, so you guys can probably start posting some of your own dad jokes here and there if you're online, and maybe we'll get lost on the, the side thread there but for a minute, but that's okay. But think about that. Like, why does a kid get such joy out of something as simple as a joke like that? Right? And I'd like for us to start thinking about what it was like to be in our own childhoods again. So many of us, we get so locked into the worlds that we're living in now and to the big purpose that we have, the passion that we have. Most of us are doing work that we have passion for. And eventually what we end up doing is we sort of like cubicleize our lives and we get so busy being grownups that we forget what it was like to be children. And so I'd like you to think for a minute and answer some questions to yourself here. What were what were your favorite games to play as a child? And feel free to post these in the, ch in the chat as well as you want. What were the games you played? Who were your biggest heroes? And if I could say by a show of hands, how many of you guys actually wanted to be your hero? Right? Yeah, I remember as a kid coming home, we'd run home from school every day. We had the same routine. We we're about a mile away from home. We'd have to walk home from school. And then we try to slide in and out before my mom caught us, but she always caught us. And then we'd have to do a half hour of homework and then she'd turn us loose to run the neighborhood. And we were lucky because we had a church right across the, the street from us. And so we'd run across to the street to the parking lot. We'd play roller hockey and football and kick the can. And we'd play all these games with all the neighborhood kids. And then, and then we had this little schedule where mom would come to the door and she'd lean out the front door and she'd say, he man's on. And then the whole neighborhood would come flocking into our house and we'd all sit there and watch He-Man. And I don't know how many of you guys remember watching He-Man as a child, but he was one of my heroes. And I remember there like sometimes even being like stripped down to nothing but my underoos, holding a fake sword and going, I have the power, right? And that was just what you did, right? You'd look for that, you'd, you'd idolize that. You were able to just go play and have fun. And that's what life entailed. And I'd like for you guys to think about what those things were and get in touch with those for just a minute. And I would submit to you that what you had as a child already equipped you for what it means to be shame resilient. And later on in this presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about shame and how shame operates in our lives. And I believe that shame is mostly an adult problem that's inflicted on children. Children are already born with what they need, right? Children are born literally with the ability to have their heads misshapen so that they can actually be born. They're like my, this is a picture of my little nephew, August. That to him is playing. And for us, that's called yoga, right? Like he's just bendy, he's flexible, he can do things, right? I'd like you to pay attention to something about your own bodies right now for a minute. Like just notice your own breath for a few breaths. How many of you are actually breathing mostly from your chest? We as adults, because of what we do with our anxieties and our frustrations and the way that we live, we often take on breathing from our chest, which actually fosters less health and more anxiety, where children are natural stomach breathers. They're built that way. They already know how to manage themselves and regulate their emotions that way. It just comes hardwired into them and then 
they begin, when they start life, they begin this process of actually learning what it means to be an adult. And in doing so, that's where we start getting into the idea of shame. So, so you can see this picture of a child sort of like holding the snake, right? Children don't know what they don't know when they're young. I remember going on a trip with my kids one time and my little daughter, she was probably seven years old at the time. We were out hiking around on this trail and all of a sudden she came running back and she was holding a lizard in her hand. And the lizard was actually like biting her hand and she still didn't do anything about it. She's like, hey, look what I've got. Like, look what I'm holding, right? And it was only after my wife started to freak out. She's like, what are you doing? Like, drop that thing, like get rid of it. That she started to cry, right? She was just out exploring the world. She didn't know what she didn't know yet. And so we're going to talk today a little bit about what the world says and what shame says versus what children have as a way of being resilient. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about some things that we can do as adults to help ourselves and to help the children in our, in our lives today. Okay, so go ahead, Chase. <clears throat> shame, there's many definitions out there. Everyone's familiar with Brene Brown's work. So if you're familiar with Brene Brown's work, she's like the guru on shame in our world today. I also like this definition by Carl Jung. Go ahead, Chase. It says, shame is a soul-eating emotion. Simply put, shame feeds on itself. Shame survives in the darkest recesses in one's insecure, self-loathing, and self-doubting mind. And here's the key here. Shame needs fear and negativity to survive. And so what we end up doing is we end up in a place of fear and negativity in the way that we cope with life. And then we wonder why we have things like what was presented in the last presentation on why we have to have so many plastic surgeries to try to make ourselves feel attractive enough, right? And yet there's all these other emotional processes going on that never get addressed. So today we're going to talk a little bit about kids and how they approach shame, how, how they approach life versus how we as adults approach life. So go ahead, Chase. Shame says, don't let people see who you are. How many of you can relate to something like that? How many of you have something in your own life right now that you desperately don't want somebody to know or see? And this is the part where the room usually loses all the air and everyone just goes total silent, right? You're probably sitting at home listening and, and going like, man, I'm so glad I'm not in that room right now, right? What do children say? Children say, I'm a warrior, tiger, hot princess, right? <laughs> It's like, that's who they think they are. And they run around and they're not afraid to say it to anybody else. That's just the way that they are. Go ahead, Chase, next one. Shame says, you'll never amount to anything. Many of us have had those messages sent to us in life. What does a child say? I'm going to be an astronaut or a pilot or a cowboy or a dad or anything else. Plug yours in, right? Every one of us had that as we were dream growing up dreaming, right? My daughter Madison was going to be an astronaut. My daughter Lexi is going to be a pilot. And that might still be the case. I don't know. Now Madison's moving into orthodontics, so we'll see. Right? But they can be whatever they want. And yet we say, I'll never amount to anything. Which is next. Shame says, don't live fully. It says, get on the sidelines. And what do children say? Watch how far I can jump from the swing. Even if it costs me a broken arm. Right? <laughs> They want to go and push themselves and fully experience life. And somehow we have a, a cohort of adult people living lives where we constantly sit on the sideline and are afraid to take risks. James, James says, I'm incapable. I'm not able to do it. What do children say? Hey, let's climb the top of that tree and let's build a fort. Who's with me? And everybody's like, yeah, let's go. Right? Next one, Chase. I'd like for you guys to just think for a minute about your own. Tap back into that place in your childhood for a minute. Maybe some of other memories other than those good things in your childhood start to come back. Maybe even pieces of where your woundedness starts to come up. And come up with your own. If you're online, post some of those in the chat. And if you have any of your, your own that are here in the room, feel free to raise your hand and share here. Uh, and while you're thinking, I'll share a few of my own, okay? So first one is you don't know anything. What do children say? This just happened last week. It was so beautiful. 
my daughter, she's a fifth grader. She came running in the house and I said, hey, how was your day at school? She's all excited and she came up to me and she said, dad, you won't believe this. She said the peregrine falcon is the fastest member of the animal kingdom with a diving speed of up to 242 miles per hour. I'm like, you really paid attention in school, right? And she could probably rattle off another hundred statistics and facts about the peregrine falcon because she's so soaked up into learning and she's willing to come and share her knowledge, right? Most of us shy away and we think it's called humility when we don't wanna share what we have or what we know. We use the guise of humility to cover up actually our own insecurities. Next one, Chase. Chase says, don't let them know you'll miss them. How many times do we choke back tears, try to put on a strong face when we're saying goodbye to somebody? My children, when they're home and I leave, and when we have family in town and they leave, they have a ritual where they race me to the corner and they're waving and screaming and crying and staring. And it's this big to do. Tell you what, that feels almost as good as it feels when you have, when you're a dog owner and you walk in the house at the end of the day and the dog comes running up, right? But that's wholehearted living from a child. And then one more here, Shane says hide. I remember the first time as a child that I, I felt the feeling of the message to hide. And I got home from school early. My mom hadn't gotten home from her job yet. My parents kept this like sparkling juice from South Africa for special occasions tucked away in the pantry. And I thought this is my chance. Like I'm gonna go steal one of those like bottles of juice and I'm gonna hurry and drink it before mom gets home. And uh, I'm down in the pantry and I hear the door open and I'm like, I'm busted. So I went running outside and I heard it and I felt it hide and I went running outside and from to, from the other door where she was coming in and as I was running I tripped and I fell and I splattered the juice all over the place and I remember in that moment maybe one of my first real instances of shame being that somehow I was a terrible kid because I had not only stolen from my parents but I had wasted what I had stolen and that I was I was hiding right children say hide Let's play some hide and seek. Let's go. I'm going to count. Right? And then one more. Shame says, don't touch that. Don't try it. It's dangerous. How many of you are living your lives right now with something you'd love to do? Something you'd love to go press yourself into or try to accomplish. And the only thing holding you back is that message that says it's dangerous or that you'll get hurt. Right? What do children say? Hey mom, look what I found, right? I had an experience with this just a couple of weeks ago too. I go out every morning and I run my dog. And um, when I was out running my morning, my, doing my morning run with my dog, I came across this kestrel. It's, a, it's an adult male kestrel that must have hit like one of the power lines or something. And he was kind of hopping around and my dog was trying to catch it. And I was trying to get my dog to stop and finally was able to catch this kestrel. And uh, I couldn't help but put my hands on it. There was something inside of me. Maybe it was still that little boy inside of me or something. I couldn't help but put my hands on it and admire its beauty and try to figure out if there was something that I could do to help it. And when I walked into the house, I said, hey, Rhiannon. And my wife's name is Rhiannon. And I said, hey, Rhiannon, you won't believe what I just found. And I came walking around the corner and I showed it to her and she like freaked out. And she was like, what are you doing, Tyler? And I said, I found this bird. I think it's like an adult kestrel. And I think it's got a broken wing. And she, the words out of her mouth were, was some little boys never grow up. <laughs> That's maybe one of the best compliments I could ever get from my wife. Right? <laughs> she said, some little boys never grow up, but that's the idea, right? We should be able to stay curious and go pursue things. And this is where like, I'm gonna side note for just a second onto like my own soapbox about, about boys and masculinity here. You know, the world right now has been really talking heavily about this idea of toxic masculinity, right? And toxic masculinity, in essence, is this idea that the masculine force shows up from a place of power and control and coercion. And we see a lot of men today, like if you were to think about the classic abuser, that's what you would think of, this power and control and abuse thing. And I would submit to you that one of the biggest issues here is, is that that power and control and coerciveness and that toxic masculinity is actually a function of 
men who have not been taught to be shame resilient. The, the only thing they know is that they're allowed to show anger and aggression because that's what's been portrayed for them. They don't understand that there's a whole other bandwidth that falls under the category of masculinity that could be included in being emotionally mature, in being engaged and connected, in being brave and strong by showing vulnerability. And, and that's where I think we, we start to lose this. You can see this happening. You can see it happening in our schools. Our boys are falling behind, right? I think part of the reason our boys are falling behind there in our schools too is because of this very thing right here that they're not allowed to continue to stay in this place of being wild and free and expressive and that they have to ha they have to peg themselves back into a system that demands them to stay in order right so thanks chase any others any other thoughts you guys are having of your own yeah go ahead and one uh, uh you can't trust those people right as an adult but then my daughter makes a new best friend at mcdonald's playland Every time I, go, <laughs> I love that. She's got hundreds of new best friends all the time. <laughs> she, gratefully, she's still so resilient. Now, even 22, she has a new best friend. That's, that's beautiful. I love that. So just so that everybody can hear in case you didn't pick up on the microphone is, as an adult, you can't trust those people. And as a child, I can make a new best friend at the, at the McDonald's Play Place every single day. That's awesome, man. Thanks for sharing. Any others? Chat here might be a few. Here's one. Shame. Your thoughts are not special or important. Children, I have a fantastic idea. That's a great one. Thank you for sharing that. I'll give you one more. Shame says you shouldn't show your emotions. Children, cry and laugh whenever and wherever. That's me. That's awesome, <laughs> right? I, I, was taught one, I was taught one time a, lo a long time ago as I was doing my own personal work to try to understand my own masculinity that, that the ability to cry is nature's wash cycle, right? That's it's so beautiful that we can wash and immediately after washing, we can have a new set of emotions flow through us and we don't have to have it all penned in and, and stuck down, right? Um, so those are great. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. Let's talk a little bit about where we go wrong, you guys. And this is moving into saying, how does a child go from having it already in them to be resilient to losing touch with those pieces of themselves? And one of the biggest places where this happens, and we talked a little bit earlier in the, in the symposium here about ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, it goes into trauma. It goes into being wounded. And we incur wounds as human beings, as children. We can't avoid it. We live in a world where we're going to get wounded. And it's in how we interpret those wounds that will either help us to be resilient to shame or they're going to move us deeper into shame and into some of the things that we find people stuck in today. Um, I want you guys to meet Cameron here. This is, this is an image of a boy that I met just this last summer. Um, sorry, I'm going to get emotional here. Um, we had a, a family event where we were going to a, a family birthday party and it happened to be being held at this pavilion at a park that was right next to a church building. And as we were going to uh, get ready to set up for this, this, this birthday party that we were going to have, I was the first one to arrive. And as I was walking up underneath one of the tables, there was a boy sitting in this position, crouched just like this. And he saw me and he was scared and he jumped up out, out from the table and he started to run away from me and he had his bike over on the corner. And honestly, when I saw him get up and start to leave, the first thought that went through my mind was, ah, oh, thank goodness, we can have some peace and quiet. We're not going to have anybody else here. But then I could see his body language and there was another thought that came through my mind that said, that kid's a wounded soul and he, he's going to need something from me today. And so I tried to hedge him off and he was trying to get away from me because he was embarrassed and he'd been crying. And I said, stop. And he stopped with his back towards me and he went rigid. And then I said, are you okay? And as I was walking towards him, he shrunk his shoulders. And then when I got up right next to him, I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, are you okay? And he instantly broke into tears and started to sob and he fell into my arms and he just started to cry with a total stranger. And after he was done crying, I started to get to know him and he, he told me that his name was Cameron. And I said, how did you get here today? 
and he said that he lives in a home where he's got an alcoholic father who gets physically abusive and he has a stepmother in the same home who has chronic pain and she can't manage her pain very well and when she gets mad they mistreated him physically and verbally and that he could see where it was going to be going and he'd just gotten in a tussle with his stepmother and so he had left and gone to the only place where he had found peace in the last year which was that church building because he had known some people that he had known at church even though the church building was all locked up and nobody was there he was sitting under a table just trying to harness the energy that he felt when he'd been in the church building right and i said well what's going to happen now like what do you do i said do i need to call the police and he said please don't call the police i've had the police over at my house a thousand times he said the only thing that happens is, is that my parents figure out how to do things without showing marks and i said okay well what else can we do and he said i don't know i said we can't just leave you here and he told me that the new form of discipline was is that when he'd go home he, they put him in a closet and then they dump a bucket of ice water on him to discipline him for having been disrespectful and so Cameron kind of taught me something there. You guys can see that. It's the instant wounding that's starting to take place, right? That poor kid has been living that way probably since he was very young. He'd been having his resilience educated out of him by wounded adults. It's not that his parents were terrible people. They're wounded as well. You've, you've all heard the saying, hurt people hurt people, right? This is what was happening. He was just the next generation coming up from a generation that had been tr treated the same way by the previous generation. And unless something different happens for that boy, he's going to end up in a life that's filled with the shame cycle, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. But we'll come back to Cameron's story in just a minute. We decided to let Cameron stay and have dinner with us and it actually turned into a pretty cool experience. So. Before we do that, I just want to talk about the cycle of shame with you guys. This is a common thing. It's something that all of us experience as human beings. If you don't feel some level of this, it's because you're either so numbed out from yourself that you don't understand yourself or you're a psychopath. So, <laughs> so hopefully you all can understand it on some level. It starts with, it starts with the belief system and the belief system says, I am basically blank. I'm not good enough. I'm inadequate. I'm unloved, I'm a failure, I'm weak. My biggest one personally is failure. I can't stand the thought of failing. That's why you almost like throw up when you come to a place like this and get ready to present because you're like, if I fail, what's it gonna mean the end of the world, right? Well, when we have experiences that reinforce those beliefs, we start to, to assume that they're true. We start to actually believe in the back of our mind that that's just the way it is, I'm a failure. I can put on a different face and things, but I'm a failure deep down inside. And that drives other parts of the cycle. So then there's the next part of the cycle, which is that I have to learn how to put on a mask because my biggest fear as a human being is, is that I'm going to be rejected. We're wired for connection and attachment with other people. We're built that way. We can't really survive without other people. And yet we now believe there's something so flawed with me that if people see it, they won't love me. And so what I do is I put on a mask and I become a performer. And sometimes I overcompensate and I become the most spiritual guy at church or the hardest working guy in the office or the kindest, most friendliest person on the outside, but on the inside, I'm feeling empty and alone. Or I underperform and I try to disappear. And I put myself on the sidelines and I become a wallflower and I don't actually let my light shine. But I'm doing that in order to fit in just enough to not be rejected. All the while I'm looking for connection and attachment, but I can't get it because I'm not able to be vulnerable enough to let people connect with me. And so that leads to the next piece, which is isolation. And in essence, I find myself locked into a box where I can't, um, I find myself locked into a box where I want connection, I can't quite get it. And, and now I'm feeling totally alone. And, and it feeds a third belief that says that, that I have to be responsible to take care of myself completely. I can't rely on other people to help me. And then the macho way of saying that is I got to be strong and independent, right? But really what we're saying is I can't trust anybody else. So now I'm living a life trying to find meaning and purpose, trying to find connection, not able to, to fully get there because I don't believe I'm worth it. And then life gets heavy and hard and I learn how to cope. 
and I learn how to cope in ways that I can control. And that's where we seek out something called the mood altering experience. The mood altering experience can be all sorts of things. It could be substances, it could be pornography, it could be shopping, it could be video games. You know, you guys, we all have our favorites, right? You know, you know what kind of a day it is when you get home from work and it's date night. You're like, what are we going to do for our date? And it's like, we're going shopping. It's like, you had a rough day, didn't you? <laughs> and then when you go shopping and you're done shopping with your wife and she gets, comes and shows all the stuff that you got. And then she's like, I didn't need any of this. Like, I'm going to take this all back. It's like, okay, wh whatever. Right. But that's, what's driving it. She's got something inside that she's trying to cope with that isn't quite working. And she's trying to do it on her own without having to be vulnerable to talk it through with me or whoever else she's got her friends. Right. After we act out those ways, and we get stuck in those habits, we either become numb and we start to lose feeling or we feel guilty. And either one of those is a sign that, you know what, maybe we should make some course adjustments and get back in touch with some of that inner child stuff that we've got. But for most of us, instead of what we do is we just let it turn into toxic shame, which is that feeling of being unlovable. And then it turns into it's this vicious spiral where we end up at the bottom of the pit, having done things that we don't wanna do, feeling stuck in places we don't wanna be in and going, how did I get here? And it all started from the way that we interpreted the wounds that we incurred and how we personalized them. Good. <clears throat> One more. So now let's transition. You guys feeling a little bit heavy in the room right now? You're, you're either heavy or tired and asleep, but I, I feel heavy in here. So let's, let's try to shift the gear a little bit. And we're gonna talk about a couple of things that we can do to help foster shame resiliency in our children. And the first place that it starts is in healing our own wounds. If we wanna be able to help the children in our lives, one of the best things that we can possibly do is to go to work on understanding our own woundedness, embracing that woundedness, meeting it with compassion and starting to move through it. And I think it was talked a little bit about earlier today, there's a concept called post-traumatic growth, which is the idea that when we go through something traumatic, we get dropped into a pit and it feels like life is miserable and it's terrible. And most of us just wanna climb back out of the hole and get back to what was normal. But because of what we've been through, we have to actually experience additional growth to make it worth all the hell that we've been through. And that's what post-traumatic growth is, is being able to take a look at those things in our lives and say, wait a second, I'm gonna make some meaning and purpose out of this. I'm gonna figure out how some of my own wounds might actually make an impact for good in the lives of other people. And when we can start to do that, we start to move into a place where we're operating from a place of resiliency instead of being alone and shut down still. So go to the next one, Jason. The first concepts I wanna talk about with this idea of resiliency is the combination of vulnerability, excuse me, vulnerability and empathy. Vulnerability by itself is scary. And it, it can actually be dangerous. Cameron, my friend, he lives daily in a very vulnerable situation. It's volatile. He doesn't know when it's going to be kind and when it's not going to be kind. He knows that he's going to be the brunt of a lot of misguided anger. He's vulnerable. And vulnerability, everyone says vulnerability is a superpower, right? It is a superpower when it's paired up with empathy. But when it's left by itself, it can be devastating. And so the idea is, is that we need to learn how to share our vulnerability, but we need to learn where and who to share it with. We need to have experiences with people who can connect with us and actually feel with us the things that we're feeling. So have you guys heard anything about something called mirror neurons? You heard of those before? There's some research right now that shows it started in monkeys. And the idea is, is that they're watching monkeys and they have the monkeys hooked up to these like brainwave machines and things, and they can see that a monkey watching another monkey peel a banana and eat it has the same brain functioning going on in their own brain as a monkey who's peeling the, the banana and eating it. And so then that research kind of expanded into this idea that we as human beings actually have something called mirror neurons as well. And our mirror neurons actually allow us to attend and to attune to other people. So if one of you is giving me a certain facial expression that connotes some type of an emotion, 
I naturally have the ability to connect to that emotion in myself and actually experience some of that with you. That's what empathy is. And so I'd submit to you four things to think about with empathy. All right, the first thing with empathy is, is that you wanna find somebody when you're sharing your own vulnerabilities who can hold and practice these four things. The first one is perspective taking. I need to be able to put myself in the shoes of the other person instead of looking at it from my perspective and, and thinking that I've got all the answers, right? So if somebody comes to me, if a child comes to me or if one of my best friends comes to me and says, hey, I'm having this problem, if I wanna be empathetic, I have to take a step back out of myself for a minute, which takes some critical awareness on my part. And I have to step into as best as I can understand it, the footprints and the shoes of the person that I'm talking with. The second part of empathy is, is that I need to remove judgment. Every one of us has instant judgments. My oldest daughter, I just found out a couple of days ago that she, uh, she's going into her senior year and uh, she just blew out her ACL and she's a track runner. So she just lost her whole senior year of track, which also has implications for scholarships and everything else. She's devastated. She's, she's, just, she's just in a, a hard place right now. And I found myself as a therapist who teaches this coming home from work after having found it out. And what were the first things that I was doing as her father? Buck up, it's going to be okay, right? Like you're going to get through this. It's no big deal. Is that empathy? That's not empathy. Empathy would be me, me being able to come through the door, remove my judgment and sit with her in her pain for a minute and say, I see you. Like, this is hard. Like this sucks. Right. And, uh, but it's hard for us to do that because most of us, we have a hard time sitting in that pain ourselves. And that's the third part of empathy. It's being able to connect to the emotion of the other person inside myself without making it about me, right? So when my daughter comes and she says, I'm disappointed, I can't believe this, I've lost my whole senior year and I might've lost my scholarships. Like, I have to tap in and dig deep to the core emotion that she's feeling. She's feeling fear. She's feeling deep grief and sadness and loss. I've never been good enough to be on that to be you know, worthy of a college scholarship. So I don't understand that, right? But I can understand grief and loss and fear because I've experienced those things in my own life. And if I can tap myself into that feeling and then connect to my daughter on that feeling, now I'm in a place of empathy. And then the final piece of empathy is, I'm gonna put this in quotes, is to speak it. And sometimes speaking takes no words at all. Sometimes the loudest message is a hug, but I'm gonna to convey to the person that I'm feeling with them. I, I had a mentor of mine who lost a daughter when she was a senior in high school in a car accident. And he just went into kind of a deep depression for a while. And about a year after she had died, he had kind of started to climb out of his depression a little bit. And he gave a talk and the talk, he, he titled the talk, the drive-by casserole. And he said that after his daughter had died, they literally had two full fridges plus their deep freeze full of casseroles and dinners that people had brought them, right? Which is just amazing that the outpouring of people who are just good at just showing love in times of need, right? And he said, thank you for all those things. And he said, but there were two occasions in the whole year that he had lost his daughter. There were two occasions when out of the blue, somebody showed up on his doorstep and knocked on the door and when the door opened, all they did without saying a word was just put their arms around him and give him a hug. And he said that for him, those two occasions were worth more than the, the entire two of refrigerators of the drive-by casserole because two people were able to actually sit in his pain with him when he felt like he couldn't carry it any longer. Right? So ask yourselves, number one, who in your life can you go to to get empathy from? This is a sad truth. I was talking to my brother about this. He's a therapist as well. I, I did a session with a couple the other day last week, and I felt so useless through the session because they talked the whole time. And I just listened and reflected some things back and forth. In the back of my head, I was thinking like, I've got to give them something of value here. Like I, they've come in and they, they're paying me good money to be here for therapy. 
And I literally said like five or 10 words the whole session. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh man, my bad. Like my whole failure piece kicks in, my shame piece kicks in, right? <laughs> Again, it's a therapist. And the, and the wife in the room says to me, she says, we've been seeing you for a long time, Tyler. This is the best session we've had. And I was like, okay, I need to get out of the way then, right? <laughs> so then I'm talking to my brother later on the phone and I'm like, Brandon, you won't believe what just happened. I said, I just got paid $150 to sit and listen to these people talk. And my brother said, that's how starved our culture is for empathy. People will pay massive money for empathy because we don't know how to do it for each other. And I believe that that's one of the biggest gaps that we're missing right now is, is that we need to learn how to do that. Like put me out of the job. Our culture needs that. Look at what's happening in our culture today. There's no empathy, right? If we could learn how to do that and spread that, I think you'd see a lot more resilience today. So next one, Chase. This next piece is, is a term called self-compassion. It was actually talked about by Dr. Madsen earlier a little bit. I wanna go into detail with you guys a little bit on how to practice this. So she, she talked about how we're more likely to motivate ourselves to change when we're meeting ourselves with love and compassion instead of self-judgment. And yet I would bet that if you guys were to go and assess how you set your own New Year's resolutions, how many of us actually set our resolutions based off of something we're really critical of on ourselves of? I'm gonna eat differently because I eat all these, this sugar or you know what, I need to lose a bunch of weight because I'm so fat, right? Like most of us are setting our goals and our intentions based off of our inadequacies and, and then criticizing ourselves into trying to get better and it doesn't work. There's a, a study, really interesting study. I love this study that's been replicated that, that they call it the donut study. And basically they brought a bunch of co-ed women into, into the office and they had them drink a big glass of water and eat a donut really quickly. And the whole goal was just to get them to feel uncomfortable with themselves a little bit. And then they'd walk them down the hall to a new room and then they'd open the door to the new room and there'd be a table full of different kinds of chocolate on the table. And then they were asked to taste test enough chocolate to be able to get an accurate taste test of all these chocolates. And some of the women, about half of the women as they're walking down the room, the, the assistant, the research assistant would turn to them and they'd say, hey, just so you know, we know that a lot of people feel really uncomfortable after eating a donut and a big glass of water and they're kind of hard on themselves. Don't be. Everybody indulges once in a while. It's going to be okay. And then the others, they just left in their own minds, right? What they found is, is that the people who got the message of self-forgiveness, they ended up eating about 29 grams of chocolate, which is pretty significant, right? You're probably not, if you're on a calorie count for the day, you're probably not eating much more the rest of the day, right? But what they found is that the people that didn't get the message of self-forgiveness, they ended up eating 70 grams of chocolate. And this is tapping into this idea that we as human beings are best motivated by love. So I'm going to do a quick exercise with you here. And if you're at home, try to, try to come along with this. I want you to think about one of those places in your childhood where you're wounded. Um, Maybe it's something big, maybe it's something small, maybe it's something that just happened over a long period of time. But sit with it for just a minute. And as you sit with it and bring it to your mind, just pay attention. The first part of self-compassion is mindfulness, which means I'm just going to become aware of it. So for this exercise, see if you can connect your physical body, all of the physical sensations in your body, starting from the top of your head, work slowly down, through your whole body to your feet, noticing what it feels like to relive this memory. Just pay attention to your body. Your body is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. You might notice certain sensations in your face or in your shoulders or neck. A lot of people will notice sensations down in their chest and their stomach. Just acknowledge what those sensations are. And then connect those sensations to the thought process that's going on in your head. What are those things that you're thinking? What are the memories that you're reliving? And then if you can't just give it a name emotionally, I'm feeling blank. I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling sadness. I'm feeling anger. Whatever it is, just acknowledge it. 
and then say to yourself, I'm experiencing a moment of suffering. This is a moment of suffering. And you'll move to the second part of self-compassion, which is something called common humanity. And common humanity is where you take your experience that you're feeling right now, that emotion that you're feeling right now, and you're going to remind yourself that what you're experiencing right now means that you're human. Shame tells us that we're the only ones. But the truth is, is that whatever it is, whether it's your infertility or whether it's you were abused as a child sexually or whether you had a harsh father or, or in my case, a terrible coach that was really abusive, whatever that is, we're not the only ones. Whatever you're feeling right now, there are literally millions of people in this very moment in the world right now feeling a similar emotion to what you're feeling. You're not alone. This is part of the human existence. So you're having a moment of suffering and you're getting a dose of what it's like to be human. It doesn't make you bad. And then the third part of self-compassion is to tap into giving yourself the same feedback that you'd give your best friend. Or in this case, picture that inner child inside of you. What's the message that that child needs? And give that child that message. You know what, Tyler? You are worthy of love and belonging. You're resilient. You've been through hard things before. I believe in you. I trust you. I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. I'm so glad you told me. Right? Let that settle in on yourself as if it's your best friend. And the cool thing about self-compassion is that you can rinse and repeat as many times as you want. So when I learned about this myself, I was in a pretty dark place. I was in a pretty rough spot in my own life. When I learned about self-compassion, I found myself doing this very exercise that I just taught you guys, sometimes 20, close, sometimes close to 100 times a day. Oh, there's my shame. Truth is, everyone feels shame. Tyler, you're a force for good. You're a work in progress, and you're going to become exactly who God needs you to be. You go for it. And then two minutes later, I'd be a failure again, and so I'd have to start all over. Right? That's the beauty of this exercise. So I challenge you guys to practice this and put it into practice and to teach your children this exercise. Hi, Chase. <clears throat> In working with our kids, I just leave a couple of thoughts here with this, is to encourage our children to be children. In the same sense that we talked about with how they're shame resilient already, Help them to understand that they have the resources inside them already and that they just need a space. And sometimes we as adults can maybe provide that space for them to tap into what's already there for them. Um, I'm going to kind of go back to the story with Cameron for a minute. Yeah, Cameron stayed with us and he ate dinner and he was still shelled up and kind of coiled up and he wouldn't say anything for the first hour while we ate. But then after we ate, we were at the park and we started playing games. And we had some wiggle riders out in the parking lot and all of a sudden he was out on a wiggle rider going around the parking lot and he was kind of getting back into motion and he was starting to move again and then we got done with our dinner <laughs> we got done with our dinner and i said went to camera and i said hey, can i take you home and he said i'm not going home i said well where can i take you he said i'm going to sleep right here in this pavilion <laughs> i said you can't do that right i said what happens if i take you home and he said, I'm going to end up in a closet with a water, a bucket of ice water on my head. And so I, I took him home for the night. I probably broke the rules. I don't know. I took him home for the night. We didn't have a bed for him. So we hung him up in a, in a hammock out on our back patio that overlooks the whole valley of Logan. And you can see the Wellsville Mountains in the, in the backdrop. And he slept there that night. And when I woke up in the morning, I went out to go get him. And we we're going to feed him breakfast and then take him home. And... As I walked out there, he didn't see me, but I could see him. And he was sitting in this hammock with just his head poking out, looking out over the horizon as the sun was coming up and was watching the mountains. And there was a look of serenity and peace on his face. And I didn't want to disturb him because I felt like he probably hadn't had enough of that in his life. Um, but that look of serenity and peace on his face reminded me that that's what he needed. He needed something to get away, to allow himself to get a break, to calm down and to experience a sunrise. And I believe that that's what life is like for many of us is we just need the space and the time 
to experience the sunrise that will inevitably come if we're given the chance to do it. So we took him out the rest of the morning. He did a hike with us. We went and explored a cave. He became a kid again. He was smiling and jumping and playing with my daughters. My daughters made friends with him because they're kids too. And that's what they do, right? It doesn't have to be McDonald's play place. Like, and then I went and I dropped him off. And I've since kind of lost contact with him. I got a Facebook friendship with him and he doesn't respond to me very well. But just this week, we, we were able to contact him and he was able to check in and he was able to tell us that since we'd met him, his stepmother had kicked him out of the house permanently as a 17 year old kid. And he's landed in the home of a best friend. And in his words, he says, my life is so much better now. He's got people who love him, people who can take care of him and people who are gonna allow him to hopefully finish a childhood. So I'd like to end with just a couple other thoughts here. This is a poem that is, was written by a, a former client of mine and one of my best friends and uh, just kind of speaks to what we've been talking about today. Sorry. When I was a kid, I felt wild and free. I knew who I was and who I wanted to be. One day something happened and wow, did it hurt. Someone I loved threw me into the dirt. When I looked down, I saw a fresh wound. How did this happen? I was confused. I laid there in silence, caressing the blow. And then came a voice that was quiet and low. Hide it, conceal it, no one can know. They'll think that you're weak if you let it show. I did what was told, not questioning the voice, but eventually I learned that it was a bad choice. A habit began, and as more wounds came, I'd hear the same voice calling my name, softly speaking the subtle words. No one loves you. You have no worth. I believed the voice and did what it said. Outside I looked fine, but inside I felt dead. Now as an adult, I'm numbed out and addicted. I rely on quick fixes as wounds are inflicted. If I never had followed the voice, I would be the kid that I was living wild and free. Let this be a lesson to any who've strayed, who find themselves helpless, alone, and afraid. The answers now lie deep inside with the one, your own inner child. Turn them loose, let them run. May we all Take the time to contact that inner child inside of all of us and to remember that it's okay to turn them loose. Let them run. Live the life that you were meant to live. Thank you. This has been an amazing symposium. Don't drop off yet. If you're still online and, and watching, just we'll wrap it up pretty quickly here. <clears throat> so again, this is a, a conference for everyone every year given by professionals for professionals who get credits. <laughs> and yet this is available to, to everyone who finds out about it. So we encourage you to share the tape. I believe um, if they go to the Davis County website, is that where they find this now? Tape? Davis County YouTube channel. Davis County YouTube channel. And would they do a search for Community Resilience Symposium? I, it'll, it'll be right there. Right on the okay, so just find the Davis County YouTube channel. And we intend to leave it there, right? So this is available to go back and to rewatch or to share with other people, which we did very intentionally. Um, for the CEUs, is that obvious? They'll know what to do, Marcy? Yeah, they have an email. They, you have an email that was sent to you to get your credits. So thank you for, for doing that. Please um, tell more people. Uh, I was imagining that if I would have found out about this as a citizen um, where I live, that I would have made, hopefully, um, once I saw that it was so good, just decided not to be so distracted and to chill and, and really partake and feel the relief because that's what it's intended to be is, is self-care and understanding and knowledge. 
And then we, uh, because we then benefit it, benefit from it ourselves, then we are able to make a difference as a community. So our goal is to have hundreds and hundreds of people in Davis County and spreading out from there who gain the skills and the understanding and who work together for community resilience. So I, I firmly believe what Susan Madsen said that individually and collectively, we can make a giant difference. And that is the goal of this. Thanks to all of you, to all the speakers, to our human services cabinet and directors. Thanks for all the work that you do. Have a great day.